play presented by Barstool Sports. We already kind of did an intro, but we're doing another one because we have uh, we got two guests on the show. It's a big show. The Ryder Cup picks were just released. We're not going to go back into the whole thing because we went into the whole thing for about an hour. We went back and forth. It got contentious. It got really contentious. Um, Owens mixers before we. Oh yeah, we got Kirk Minahan, um, who's an avid golf guy who likes to fire shots and. You know, so he he gets into the fray with us pretty good. Um, and then we have Marty Fish, um, you know, former professional tennis player. He's the captain of the Davis Cup team. Is that right, Lurch? That is. That's correct. Pretty um, much like the World Cup of tennis. Okay. Right. And he uh, played against everybody. He played against uh, Roger, um, Nadal. He played against, he's played against everybody. So we get into I mean, he was a top of ten player stuff. of the world. He was the number one American. In yeah, the world. Absolute stuff. Yeah. Got a new documentary out on Netflix uh, that just came out a couple days ago, September 7th, that goes through um, the whole thing, his whole life, his career, um, mental health, all kinds of good stuff. And um, Frankie even asked about the grunting that goes on in tennis. I, think I called it moaning. He he quickly corrected me to grunting. <laughs> yep. Had to be asked. Right. But if you if you were a professional in that sport, you're going to correct someone that gives that kind of annotation to the... Yeah. It's a moan. <laughs> he knows it's a moan, too. Watch watch the YouTube version. If you're listening to the audio, it's at the very end of the show. If you listen to the audio, you're gonna think that he was confidently saying it was a grunt. Watch the YouTube version, and he he really tried to sell it, saying it's a grunt. He, he knows he moans. For I mean, a he's living. been answering that question for yeah. decades. So he's he a was moaner. For he's it. a moaner. He was ready. Yeah, I played he tennis. Was, at yeah, Lurch too. did enlighten us that he was a bit of a grunter slash moaner himself. But yeah, a oh, great interview. He's yeah, he's, he's a awesome. Stick. Yep, really good player. He's boys with Jake Owen, so he's the man. He's really good. So um, we got Kirk Minahan and we got Marty Fish. We also got Owens Mixers as Transfusion Thursday. Owens is going to be all over the Ryder Cup as well, which is the main talking point of this entire podcast on this day. Um, so do yourself a favor. Go get some Owens Mixers. Uh, OwensMixer.com. They've got the uh, what they call the store locator. So if you don't know where to get it, can't figure it out, um, please go check out their website and then you also use amazon all right amazon's got next day shipping hit the button check out amazon hit the button they bring it the next day you get whatever you want i got mint cucumber and lime and i got the barstool transfusion right here they got um margarita mix now people love margaritas so yeah we love all yep. no one's great right fellas? yeah i think at some point um the word mixologist or the term mixologist was used as like a sarcastic remark where it was like oh this guy thinks he's a mixologist like you go back there you try and make a drink you come out maybe not as good as the professionals at the bars right like you'd say look at this guy like what is he doing owens mixers allows you to actually become a mixologist like a real you went to school for it there, there is nothing to mess up here it's already done for you the mix has been perfected you just have to add your own vodka your own rum whatever you're trying to do whatever kind of drink you're trying to get into the mix has already been done the hard part is over owens has you order it on amazon it's as easy as it can be jeffrey bezos has that thing uh, you know as smooth as a whistle. Humming. smooth as a whistle he, uh um what's the whistle one as wet as a whistle yeah. no wet as a whistle but he's, got, as a whistle, a, he's got the system as wet as a whistle i don't know that no. that works smooth at all. as butter smooth, smooth as, as butter. butter smooth as butter smooth as butter okay there we go no whistle we there. got there but all i know is that you know bezos is doing the damn thing get yourself some owens, owens mixers. mixers go check them out uh pour it in with your favorite liquor and you have yourself an awesome cocktail all right it's time to welcome in kirk minahan and to get into you know some inevitable Ryder cup discussion Bezos is actually trying to reverse I his age. That. Yeah, That's no, like, age. He does, nowadays he does such stereotypical billionaire shit. He should though. No, I know. It's like Absolutely. It, feel, it feels like it's If you're I, Jeff Bezos, why don't you want to live forever? No, I know. Uh, but I just right. feel like every time I see him he's like he's like I'm getting in a rocket. And then yesterday I saw that he's trying to uh cherry pick all the top scientists to reverse the aging process. Millions it's like, of dollars. It's like, yeah, that's what a billionaire would do. You know what else I noticed? I was picking up Dave the other day from Southampton, and everyone there runs. Like, I picked him up at an airport, and everyone runs out there, and they're biking. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, these people want to be super healthy because they're so fucking rich and so happy that they want to continue to do that. That's, like, the only reason... <laughs> That they're doing what they're doing. You know what I mean? It's a good motivation. Like the street was right. filled with people in like athletic gear running. I think there's something to that. I've never thought like of that. My before. life's Bicycling. so good. I like want to They're all like, let's like extend looking this at each thing. other being like, let's like fucking keep going. <laughs> let's keep this thing rolling. 
That is so fucking true. Whereas most people are like, dude, let me get unhealthy and fucking miserable. We like, say that the only all the time. joy, it's the only joy poor. in my life is eating go- dog shit food and then I'll die. Trent and I say that all the time. Where we're just like, what? What's the difference? If I eat this fucking sandwich, what is the difference well, the diff- tomorrow? That person's thinking like, I'm no longer gonna have a fucking twenty million dollar like Southampton house and I'm not going to, I'm no longer going to be like the luckiest person on earth. Right. The donut or the prosciutto that we eat is the best part of our day. Right. They get to look at a bank account and be like, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and that's the difference. Oh. All right. Here's Kirkman. In. All right. Four plays with my Barstool Sports. We got a big show. Um, monumental moment. The shit that I'm looking at right now is um, pretty wild. I, I bet people probably never thought they would ever see this. We're joined by Kirk Minahan, who we have on usually around Masters time. Um, but sneaky, huge golf guy. And I know you've been uh, delivering some Ryder Cup takes. A good amount of your callers ask about the Ryder Cup. So, Kirk, you'll probably be neutral. I'm obviously a European Ryder Cup fan. These guys are U.S. Ryder Cup fans. And we got Kirk Minahan. Seems reasonable. Yeah, I, I, I get I, over the last ten or fifteen years, I get them in that group for Europe more than the U.S. I have not like the U.S. players, the U.S. guys. So uh, makes sense. Yeah. I, I might be more in your world here, though. I think we're going to disagree on some of the stuff, but yes, it's always good to be here. So it's pretty fucking obvious. Kevin Kisner was not picked on the Ryder Cup team. Uh, Steve Stricker just announced he went with Tony Fee, Alexander Shoffley, Jordan Spieth, Harris English, Scotty Scheffler, and Daniel Berger were his picks. Uh, no Reed. No Kevin Na, no Kevin Kisner. Um, That means very clearly that I will be rooting for the European Ryder Cup team. Um, I got to say, I'm getting a lot of tweets from people in Europe. So people in Europe are pretty pretty fired up, pretty excited. Um, Other people are not. How do you gentlemen up there in the red, white, and blue feel about your, uh, your picks for your team? That's two and seven in the last nine, by the way. You know, disappointed in our team's decision on to not take the correct players. I would have loved to see Kevin Kisner. You know, play for our country, the red, white, and blue, the stars and stripes. Um, You know, just like in any sort of um, sport that I watch, any fandom I have, I will stick behind my team no matter what. You know, I've made the comparison of the New York Islanders. Don't put out the correct power play players. I'm not just going to go root for the New York Rangers. I'm going to stick with them. I'm going to complain. I'm going to argue. I'm going to debate. But I will always bleed red, white, and blue. I cannot be more excited for the Ryder Cup. And I know my pal Trent here feels uh, the same or similar. Very similar. Yeah, would I have liked to have seen Kevin Kisner on this team? Yes, I think that would have been great for the team. But like Frankie's saying, I'm not going to create this world where as soon as something doesn't go my way, my team doesn't do the thing that I wanted to do, I'm going to stop my feet like a child and go to the other side. Like you would, Oh, you would that's, crea- that's not representing you it properly in any way. Nope. You had created this scenario. Oh, and when I made that Photoshop of you wearing the European colors, you responded and said, I knew you guys were rooting for Kevin Kisner not to be on this team. I, I, we don't have to abide by these fake sides that you've picked. Yes. Like, we no, just I don't think have you, to do I that. I think you wanted you – wanted, you preferred – a world where Kevin Kisner doesn't get picked so that I then have to root for Europe more than you wanted Kevin Kisner to get picked. Well, the main, you created that right, world. The main thing is that I think that you... But I like, think once that world was created, you guys were more... You were rooting more for that, which was clear by your... I want to do... Arnold I, tweets a week ago when the captain's picks weren't even made yet. I wanted to amplify how idiotic that idea was. And that's what we did with that Photoshop. That, and now it's just come not, true. You it fired off like a late night tweet that you're going to root for Europe if Kevin Kisner doesn't make it in a time when like he probably should have made the team prior to the playoffs beginning and like you're 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 holding us to these rules that like we like we have to agree that if the one player that you wanted to be on the team does not make the team we are no longer like we're the idiots for for rooting for a team that's 2 and 7 like it's been I don't understand how we have to abide by those rules that's an insane thing to put into I never said you had to abide by those no, rules No but you're but I never like did I say that when did I say that? Well, you're not saying that we have to root for Europe, but you're you're clearly on the argument that is it is that we are just like sheep and that we are going along with, you know, T- Team USA no matter what happens. It's like that is what we've been doing for the past 9 Ryder Cups and they've gone 2 and 7 just because Kisser didn't get picked in this one, we're not supposed to root for them. I don't understand. We've always rooted well, for Team USA. I, well, clearly now that I'm rooting for the other team, I'm going to chirp you guys. You are the opponents now. Okay. It's a weird place to be, man. Really weird. I don't know. I just don't like it. Kirk, where do you fall on all this? Well, what's lost in the whole thing, like I get that Riggs was hammered one night and made a fucking video. Like we've all been there. I get that. 
But the reality is, is that would have been an absurd pick by Stricker today. Like, we all like Kisner. We all think he's gritty. He was fucking awful in the playoffs. He was dead last in one of the events. Missed the cut in the other. You can't – to me, like, I, I individually don't have a big problem with each pick. I know they weren't inspiring. Not picking Reed was a great move by Stricker, I think. Picking Reed would have been insane. Uh, but if you want to make a case for, you know, a grinder, Kevin Na is a much I, – I can, I can have a Kevin Na conversation – What's the Kisner conversation at this point, Riggs? Did he play well? The pres- they win the President's Cup every year. Like, what's the what's the Kisner what's the Kisner case? A couple things that I think are huge, and what I'm a, I have no real issue generally with the picks overall. Like, yeah, I would have liked to have seen Kiz instead of Daniel Berger. That probably would have been my only change. We love Scotty Scheffler; he's awesome. There's a lot of guys on the team that we clearly love and have relationships with. My issue is with actually building a team and coming from and following team sports, where and the analogy is you cannot build a Stanley Cup winning team with 20 goal scorers. You got to have guys that go in the fucking corners. You got to have guys that dish. You got to have guys that block shots. That's how you build winning actual teams. And what I think the U.S. is missing is not talent, is not guys that have the characteristics golf wise to play whistling straights. We have that. We have nine of the top 11 ranked players in the world. And one of those two that we don't have is not even in this tournament. He's in international team Louis Oosterhuizen we're not lacking the talent what we lack is a team of genuine chemistry at the, when they go out there they look at the guy next to them when they're in the team locker room they look at the guy next to them and they say fuck Europe we're gonna go out there and win because that's what the Europeans do that's why they are lower on the world rankings all the time and they come out and win they've won seven of the last nine and what I think Kevin Kisner does is he comes into a locker room like that he does have a little bit of a veteran role amazingly he's 37 those guys all like him they respect him in 2019 they literally voted him the number one guy they like to get paired up with the PGA Tour and and he has a phenomenal match play record overall. So what I think that brings to the team, you're not looking for your 12th guy. It doesn't have to fill all these characteristics of bombing the golf players. I think you need someone who, when you have two guys in your team who are two of your biggest firepowers, when you have Bryson and Brooks who fucking hate each other, when you have history of, of you had Spieth, you had Reed calling the fucking media and bitching about him. You had Phil Mickelson bitching at Tom Watson. You had uh, two decades ago, you had players literally threatening to boycott for the American team if they didn't get paid. So this team has a history for two decades of horseshit chemistry, it's no coincidence, in my opinion, that they're also 2-7 and seven, despite being favorites almost every year over that stretch. I think you need a guy, you can use that 12th or 11th pick, or everyone would call it, who does fill a good amount of the stuff, match play record. He won three starts ago, so it's not like he's got horrific form. Yeah, he didn't play well the last two weeks, but it's not like he's got horrific form. He won three starts ago. He's 18th in the points. He's not 60th. So I think it's a lot of things that this team actually needs. Kevin Kisner fills. That's how I feel about it. I think the other, and that's all fine. But I think the bigger issue, the larger issue, is that you have guys, and I'm not putting speed in that category, so I don't think it's true, but I think guys like Johnson – I think guys like Kepka, I just think they don't care that much about the Ryder Cup. And I think that was true with Tiger. I think it was true with Furyk. I think it was true with Mickelson, with Davis Love. And that's why you want to go back, you know, guys like Montgomery, Olathal, Sevy, Harrington, Clark. I think I said Westwood. Those guys. And now that goes from generation to generation. That bridge has never happened with the Americans. Like that core American. I remember Tiger Woods saying, nobody knows what Jack Nicholas's Ryder Cup record is. But they know how many majors he won. That's the American attitude, good or bad. That's why they win more majors. The European players, they are going to – you saw it this past weekend. It, it, it's the same thing. Uh, the quarters don't care as much. Lexi Thompson doesn't – They it, there's something ingrained in this generation, the American golfer versus the European golfer. They just don't care as much. And I don't think – maybe I'm wrong. I don't think Kevin Kisner coming in there. I don't think all of a sudden Brooks Kepp is going to be like, oh, holy shit. Uh, the fucking Ryder Cup's important. Let's go, guys. Like, I, I don't – I think they're picking the best players. I think that's their best chance. Minnesota four years ago, they had they they had the best players and they won. I think again, I think that, that is um, not giving enough attention to what it what um, a team actually is. I think that this is an individualistic sport. I think I agree with everything you're saying about the American team. I think that we've got guys that make an outrageous amount of money. A lot of them are the richest players to play the game of golf. Um, This has been an extremely prosperous time for them. And again, I think that the Ryder Cup, they're going to claim and they're clearly going to say in interviews how much it means to them. And I don't think it means nothing to them, but it doesn't mean to them what it means to the Ryder Cup, uh, the European Ryder Cup player when you go player by player. 
Um, right. I think that at least half of their team on the European Ryder Cup team, maybe three fours. It is the biggest week of their entire career. And if you ask a lot of the Americans, that it might not even be a top four week for them on the calendar. It's majors. It's winning for me. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just when we get into a conversation about how to build a legitimate unit, a team, I think that you you do get the best out of more of your guys if you build a locker room, whatever you want to call it, locker room guys, um, a, an entire atmosphere that is built on being one unit that goes out together. When you're paired with a guy in foursomes, which we suck at, which is alternate shot, like there has to be chemistry, I think, above where a guy is strokes gained off the tee. I think you need to, you're using that guy's golf ball half the fucking holes. Like you need to be close with that person and you need to have something that is built over time. I don't think it comes with just the captain's picks. I think it comes with like Kiz said on this show a month ago or after he won, where he's like, I would love to see a, a team bonding thing where we go somewhere for two days and we get shit faced and just hit balls and fuck around for two days. Then you be like, when you go have beers with somebody, you become boys with that person. You become friends with that person. And instead, what what the U.S. team does, is, and again, as Kevin Kisner said this himself, is they do these like corporate outing type feels where it's like we are going to be friends now for two days. It's going to be very fun. And then they did. And then there's just this robotic element to it. And yes, like we could get away here and there with like building the uh, setting the course up however we want home soil we have the advantage bomb and gouge and we're, we're we've won whatever half of the last four of those on u.s soil and we've gotten dominated overall over the last nine over the last nine rider cups over the last two decades so i think that kevin kisner is a piece of that missing uh, is a big piece of the puzzle a missing piece and he would do more for the team. And, and when people say, like, Kevin Na, I don't think Kevin Na has, like, the the chemistry, the relationship, the team guy, the locker room guy type thing that Kiz brings. And I think a lot of golfers scoff at that. And they're like, no, look at the data. But that's how you build fucking teams. That's what people that come from team sports understand that I don't think the golfers understand. Yeah, no, Team, team America, Team USA is very egocentric it's very the team chemistry stinks but i think the question that kirk is asking and i think it's a fair one is kevin kisner the antidote like is is he gonna walk in there and is it gonna change everything like you you're acting like it's it's the it's the limitless pill like as soon as team usa takes the kevin kisner pill they're now going to be dominant in the Ryder cup yeah. where i think where i think you're all, where i think i get what you're saying Riggs, but i think the issue is is kevin kisner it's great that he has that attitude but in the perfect world the panacea for that is the Europeans' best players have that attitude. Rom right. has that attitude. Rory has that attitude. The best U.S. players, they they care, but they don't really. They, he, Dustin Johnson doesn't care as much as Rory McIlroy or John Rom. He just doesn't. He's not ingrained to think that. And then until that attitude changes, then the you can bring in all the Kevin Kissers in the world you want. You can bring. In, you, it's not going to change. You know the core problem, the, the real issue. But I think that is how you change it. That is how, like when you when you have a, a a team of prima donnas in any other sport, and then you can't. It, it's a combination of like coaching, leadership, and then it's also a combination of bringing in the right guys that build a culture within that team. And I'm not saying that just throw Kevin Kisner in there, boom, it's done. I think that's a step seriously in the right direction. And when I haven't seen those steps, it discourages me as like, obviously a lifelong fucking American and U.S. Ryder Cup fan. Like, it very much discourages me that they're not going to go in the right direction. Because I think that when you have guys and you have a culture that Rory McIlroy entered into, that John Rahm entered into, that was already built, again, by guys like Graham fucking McDowell, who hit the winning Ryder Cup putt in 2010. You had Jamie Donaldson in 2014, I think it was, who hit that shot to like an inch and wins the Ryder Cup like those are names that are not Rory McIlroy's but when those guys enter a team of a culture that has been built for years where those guys care more than you could possibly imagine it seeps into you that holy fuck these guys that I'm from the same you know uh continent with with the Europeans or the same country with the Americans like this means so much to these guys that now it means so much to me. Like that happens naturally, I think, by building the culture. But when you enter a place where everyone's sort of doing their own thing, I don't think you're able to, um, you know, allow that to seep into everyone. And I think the U.S. has failed at that. And I think a guy like Kevin Kisner would have been a huge addition to that. That's how what I think. Uh, crypto, Bitcoin, NFTs. You guys know anything about this stuff? Anything? Sort of. Not so much. some. 
crazy stat that like 20% of people are all invested in NFTs or something like that. It was insane. It was like 20 people with money in the market are all already invested in NFTs. And if you're not a part of this world, then you're just like watching other people make money. That's a higher number than I would have thought. Yeah, it was nuts. Way higher. What is an NFT? What exactly is an NFT? That's I just we, a... I know the thing to say now is like, what is an NFT? Like, oh, I don't get it. But that is actually how I feel. Like, I know people that seems like if you don't understand it, then you just sort of act like, oh, I don't get it. But I, that's actually how I feel because I don't understand it. That's, the only that question I, came I from say, a genuine place. Right. Came from I, a genuine right, place. I, I think it's rights to a digital image. Is that wrong? It's a non-fungible token. It's something that had, cannot be touched. You had to look that up. I did. I, I, I saw you looking also, at that. I was going to say fungible. Nothing for me. That's, that's, that's <laughs> like you, it's, you it's might as well have said def, NFT definition. Um an NFT. Like that was well, no, what you it's just non, said. It's a non fungible token. It's something that you can own that you can't like physically touch. It's a digital it's a digital currency. Okay. It's a digital thing. It's a it's the digital version of a of a sports card. I mean it, it could be anything. I can make um, a picture of me holding this American flag in NFT and like if if I say that it holds value, someone buys it, all of a sudden it has value. That's how it keeps going up. Well, um, this whole world, okay, gentlemen, as we know, it's an ever-changing landscape. The Modern Finance Podcast, uh, hosted by Kevin Rose, is a great place to listen, learn about the latest trends in crypto, brush up on fundamentals. Crypto is not for everyone until you listen to Modern Finance. Ten years ago, some people called cryptocurrency a scam. Five years ago, people thought it was a fad. Now, it's already over a trillion dollar market and growing. The Modern Finance Podcast helps you make sense of all the coins, NFTs, and chaos. Now is the time to equip yourself with knowledge of where things are going. The financial landscape is harder than ever to navigate. You don't have to do it alone. Download and subscribe to Modern Finance wherever you listen to podcasts. Download and subscribe to Modern Finance. Um, I'm actually going to do this for the flight, gentlemen. So I'm going to learn. Next time we come back on this show, I'm going to tell you guys all about the crypto and the Bitcoin and the NFT. And I'm gonna, we're going to be dialed in. Please do. I, I hope your answer is as good as Frankie's. It's a non-fungible token, and that's it. I hope that's the whole definition. Sick. Yeah, based on a word, I don't even know what it means. Basically, <laughs> I think the big, almost the bigger issue though is like, you know, you have Steve Stricker and Jim Furyk. Like the, the leadership is not going to allow that kind of atmosphere either. It's not like you're picking guys that are particularly charismatic. I mean, Steve Stricker and Jim Furyk are as fucking boring as it gets. Right. Like you want guys who are going to think outside the box and go crazy. Well, find a captain like that. Find a captain who is the a Kisner kind of attitude. That's maybe the way. We, I, that, that's where I would go. Maybe we make Kisner the captain, Riggs. Just do I that. love it. Look, <laughs> well, I think, I I think like it's it. just uh, sorry, Riggs. I think it's always this idea that the player who's the captain has to be this great player. I, I've never really understood why that is. Because you're a great player, you're going to be a great cat. Like you have to have a major. I mean, no, Stricker doesn't. But yeah, or you have to be this sort of celebrated player. Why? Why not find a journeyman <clears throat> like a Pat Perez type player? Mm-hmm. You know, to be the captain of the team. That to me would be way more interesting. They're picking Jim Furyk or whoever the next captain's going to be, David Toms or whoever. I mean, there's no inspiration. There's no thought attached to that. So, Riggs, you've been talking I a have, lot about the embodiment of the U.S. team, and I've really and all we're talking about is Kevin Kisner. Do you think they made the correct choice? Eleven out of twelve players. Like, do you think like um, you think the United States made unbelievable choices except for Kevin Kisner? I think I like the Scotty Scheffler choice a lot. I don't like he wasn't necessarily a lock. I think because Patrick Reed. <clears throat> Um, I do think what Kirk said early on, I thought was a was a ballsy move by Stricker to not take Reed and to take you know a chef or a burger over him, um, because again I think like it's easy to look at Reed's record at Captain America and that obviously stands for a lot, but what he did after 2018, like no team should stand for that. When you when you and your wife are calling and throwing the other players under the bus, like you think like Bill Belichick, you'd be off that team in a second, no matter how good you were. So I respected the shit out of that move. Um, and yeah, I think like overall it was, look, I think four of the six, six guys qualified automatically. I think four of the six were essentially locks, right? Like Finau, he just won. He's been one of the most consistent players in the world for three or four years. Um, Xander Shoffley, been one of the best players on planet earth for the last three or four years, uh, won the gold medal. Jordan Spieth clearly has the pedigree, has had a damn good year and come back and almost qualified in his own. Harris English won twice. He won the tournament champions and he won at Travelers and he's been one of the most consistent players all year. So, so, so I think like those, those 10 right there are pretty much locks here. You got two spots in my opinion, where you could, you know, get creative, try to fill roles, whatever. I think Scheffler, I like a ton because 
He does hit the ball pretty far. His ball strike is good, and he could be a pretty streaky good putter. And he's young. I like the idea of like bringing in definitely like a young guy to help kind of get the turnover going. Um, and then I would have just liked to seen Kiz over Berger. So yeah, overall, I don't hate like the thing, but I also don't think he had a ton of necessarily like choices, if you will. Like I, you know, it would have been different if like those. Um, I mean, he made choices there though. Were, I just think you're too close to the sun here. I really do. Like, Kevin Kisner is our guy. He's our boy. We, you're making amazing, um, you know, reasonings, and, and, and you're describing why he would be a good fit. But, like, you're also not giving Stricker and Team USA the credit for making a move like taking out Patrick Reed. And you're not giving them any well, credit I just did for, like, I just no, said. I know, but prior to me asking the question, but, like, this team is ready to try and win, I think. Like, they're making different decisions. They're making moves. They're putting in a Scotty Scheffler, a new guy. Like, if you weren't so close to the Stun with the Kevin Kisner thing, I think you'd be jacked up about this team going into the Ryder Cup. Instead, it's like, oh, like ho hum, oh boo hoo. We don't have Kevin Kisner. I'm going to go root for Europe because our team's never going to change their way of thinking. They're always going to go for the best players. They're never going to make decisions based off the years prior, which they literally are just doing right now. I I think again that they didn't necessarily make like a groundbreaking choice. Right? Like it wasn't like he went. Um, extremely did. I think Scheffler was 14th in the points, so it's not like it was a um, crazy ballsy picks, but yeah, I, I think there's absolutely encouraging signs. I 100% agree with that. It's not, um, like, even if I hadn't done the European thing, the tweet, maybe I was drinking, who knows, but, <laughs> like, I would, there are just, uh, encouraging signs, absolutely, and I'm not out here saying, like, um, I don't think I've ever said it, like, I'm rooting 100% against, like, America. Like I said, there's a lot of friends. I'm rooting for the European team. I hope there's a tie. I think a tie would be fantastic. No, and you can't do that. I'm going to go. Hey, Kirk, come on, come on. Well, no, a tie would crazy retain the cup now. for Europe. Um, so Europe would win. And you're rooting against tie. Justin Thomas. You're rooting against Jordan Spieth. You're rooting against Tony Finau. You are Team Europe. When we're there at Whistling Straits, they're going to look at you and be like, look at this fucking guy rocking Team Europe shit. Like, you are an American golf fan. Justin and Thomas is going to walk by you, and he's going to be like, what are you doing? And you guys need to realize that if Europe wins this, which they, I believe, are two to one under, go ahead, right now, go ahead. We pal. are going to have a go massive ahead, Riggs was right campaign. We're going to oh, have a oh. massive Riggs was right. Campaign. Well, I don't care, uh, but like you're going to go oh, like party care. with Tommy Fleetwood, and I mean, I just don't give a fuck about and Matthew yeah. Fitzpatrick. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm going to don my that's fucking gonna, that's gonna stars and strikes. That's going to feel real dirty. Kirk, where, I mean, Kirk. how do you allow this? This guy has no backbone. I know you said that you like have liked the European teams in the end, yeah. but you have to stick with your team. Right, well, like I, you I stick with well, teams. Well, it's one or the other, though, Frank. You also can't do the well. I like some U.S. guys. Like you're either in or you're out. Like now he's now he's moving the goal. Thanks. Yeah, it's, yes. Like 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 Riggs, you're, you, this is it. This is your spot right here. The microphone's gonna be yours in a second. You are either in 100 percent with Europe or you're in 100 percent with the United States. You can't watch the Ryder Cup and be like, well, you know, I hope both team wins or I hope there's a fucking tie in the right. You watch it for three days and you're like, oh, you know what? I hope it's 14 14. No human being thinks that while they're watching the Ryder Cup. I might be. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> I feel bad that you're in this situation because you are such a passionate golf fan. You're such a passionate fan of the Ryder Cup. I feel bad that you have put yourself in this position that you are actually going to physically be at Whistling Straits and you cannot root for your countrymen at Whistling Straits Ryder Cup while we were going to be there. We're going to be watching the fist bumps and the high fives. We're going to be in the mix and you're just going to be like, nah, I don't like that. Drunk rigs really put you in a bind. That's a fucking shame, man. That's I the feel bad shame for you guys that you're going to be there and you're going to be surrounded by all this negative energy because the U.S. team, once again, which they've done for two decades, is going to be heavy favorites, and they're going to lay an egg. And the European team, which is a lot more chemistry and exciting things to root for, is going to go into enemy territory with no fans there except for Riggs, by the way, because people can't even travel over from Europe. And they're going to steal a victory in Wisconsin like they've done many times oh, over. God. And everyone's going to sit there and dirty? be like, whoa, we put the best players out there. I don't know how we didn't win. Oh, we but you just the said they made good choices. The team they made one like good one and one bad what, one, I would say. Who else? Like, What bad choices what did it, they make? I don't. Like, I what think team, they should have put Kevin Kisner over Daniel Berger. I've been very clear if, about that. What if Team USA up. just wins? Then they're the favorites. Of course they're supposed to win. They're on home soil. Okay. That's what I thought. What if, what if, what if Daniel Berger goes 3-0 and 1? Right. If the U.S. doesn't win, then I'm not going to be impressed. If he wins, okay, then I'll be like, yeah, they did. 3-0-1, you know, wins a singles match, and the U.S. wins. Will you say you were wrong about, about the pick and they should have taken uh, Daniel Berger and not Kisner? 
We'll see how everything goes. But if that if everything else <laughs> remains the same and that looks equal, then I, that hasn't happened yet. I'm not going to live. I understand in this that. But I'm giving world. you a scenario. I'm giving you a scenario. You know what else hasn't happened I, yet? Like how, the team how can not even know how they're going to react in the future. I you know what think. else hasn't happened yet? Like the team hasn't had bad camaraderie and like all these bad negative energy yet. Like two of the guys like, don't even talk to each other. What do you mean? Like, but it hasn't happened yet, though. One of them's getting shit in the media for bullying the other. What do you mean? But, but, Frank, but Frankie, Frankie, yeah, Frankie, don't fight that fight because I don't think it matters that much. But that's going to happen. Like if they lose, get ready. DeChambeau is going to be an asshole. Yeah. Kep, first of all, I, I, is Kepka good? You guys know better than me, probably. Is Kepka playing? Is he well, I think play? he left. I think he withdrew precautionary reasons. I don't know that. Right, it so was he's going to play. Yeah, I, I think, think that's so. the plan. Okay. My so point with, with what I said is like. It, I think there's so much heat on this and Riggs, like credit to you that you are bringing a lot of this to the forefront on social media. But like, I think that they are been backed into a corner where they have to have good camaraderie and they have to have this like team um, chemistry. I mean, this is the only thing that people have been talking about when it comes to the Ryder Cup teams that they don't care. They all hate each other. They're not going to come together. They're not going to win. Like you've given them bulletin board material. You have given them the the, the moment that every coach wants. Like, hey, these guys don't think we can go out there like a team. They don't think that we like each other. They don't think that we made the right choices. Go out there and prove yourselves. Like this is now the best team USA to root for in the past nine Ryder Cups. Right. It's almost like I'm a hero. And oh, essentially oh, if they oh, come you, out yeah, and win, that. it'd be like well, you're right. Ryan Brooks, where Ryan right, Brooks though. was a dickhead to that team. And he was like, rally around your hate for me, become a team. He wasn't on the other And bench, you will though. be victorious. So look, if, if, they go out and they are like, yeah, man, we saw all these people on social media dogging us and it forced us to come together and we won. Then I would be very happy that the no, United States team was able to rally around some points that I made. So thank you, Frankie. It's a good point. I don't know. I don't know, man. It's just sad to see. It is. It's sad to see. It's going to be a fun Ryder Cup, boys. There's a lot at stake. I also shout out to Barstool Sportsbook. When I arrive in Pennsylvania this evening for Barstool Classic uh, next couple days, I will be placing a large wager on the European Ryder Cup team to win the Ryder Cup. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's you're on Team Europe, man, and we're going to see how, you know, those colors better not bleed when we're at Whistling Straits. Right, and we've had this conversation before, <clears throat> too. If, you know, Team USA wins and someone is nice enough to invite us into the Team USA room to party with them we are not putting your name on that list we're leaving you outside you have to sit outside uh, and you have to cross your legs and sit on the grass and pout yeah you don't get to tell me what to do but you don't get to tell me what to do for you're me. not going to agree to that you're not going to agree that if, if, if and i'm going to sit with my legs crossed and pout no i'm yes. not going to agree to that okay but you are you have to agree that you will not enter any sort of celebration when it comes to team usa I'm not going to celebrate with the American no, team. No, no, you can't. You can't, enter, not with the, you can't enter the cut. You can't enter the celebration. I can enter wherever I want. It's free. Oh, oh my god! This is, oh, by the way, by the way, way, by the way, everything's perk. fucking perfect. By the way, this guy. What do you mean? Like, he wants. okay, he all okay. The if the European Twitter players, if, if so, Matthew Fitzpatrick so, and these guys, which happens all the by time, the way, are invited into the team room afterwards, oh how am I not, dude? You're so brave rooting for Europe, but then all of a sudden, when USA stomps their ass, you're gonna go fucking patty cake all their fucking hands. By the way, we got some audio playing. By the way, um, Kirk, do you know his Tiger Woods hedge? Have you heard about that? I don't know. I don't think so. Oh, boy. Riggs, why don't you go ahead and explain that? Well, if Tiger Woods shows up, that, that could be a really interesting scenario. He said he'll root for Team USA says, if Tiger Woods he, shows up. Right. He said he'll switch again. He'll say <clears throat> his two things were the first one was Kevin Kisner, if he doesn't get picked, I will root for Team Europe. If he gets picked, I will root for Team USA. And then a couple weeks ago, he was like, oh, by the way, if Tiger Woods shows up, like – to the to the Ryder Cup, I'm also going to root for Team USA. So he's just putting in all these little hedges because I'm he knows he for backed Team himself Europe. Into I'm a Europe court. guy. I'm going to place my wager on Team Europe, and I'm going to be Europe all the way. Is that a commitment to Tiger Woods? Even if Tiger Woods shows up, absolutely. Okay, okay. and you won't, but you won't I love commit Tiger to Woods. not Tiger celebrating. Woods is. Tiger Woods has been a part of two decades of losing Ryder Cup. So I just want to, I just want to I, he won't commit to he won't commit to the celebration because know. he knows that that's a pretty big chance. There's a pretty good you know, chance that that happens. You know, what, you know what ultimately comes down to, and he knows this, is he called his shot too early. He was feeling Dude. cocky after Kisner won. And two I weeks called later, it before was, Kisner won. He, I called it before Kisner. Whatever, won. he was playing better. You would have never done it. He was so bad in the playoffs. Even you have to admit. I mean, the playoffs destroyed him. I mean, I, wow. I mean, no, like, they did. He was, he was never going to make this team. Stricker was never going to pick him. That was never going to happen. Never. 
You don't think right after the win that Stricker was like, I think I'm going to take this guy? Nope. Nope. Absolutely not. That's, to me, the fundamental issue with the American mindset. Right. I understand that, but I'm saying it never crossed. Listen, if you had had done what Horschel did a few years ago, you know, during the playoffs, different conversation. But the minute he played lousy in the playoffs, it made things a lot easier for Stricker. I think Stricker was relieved. I also, I always think they throw way too much weight on that because, I mean, with the exception of the year when we got stomped, 2018, like there's, there's a three weeks off, a month off between now and then. Like, I don't think anyone who's hot in the playoffs is all this. Like, they're not playing pet competitive golf for a month. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no I think that's fair, too. But I, and my, other, my only other thing is, like, if the guys are rooting for the U.S., U.S., there are assholes on this U.S. team. I don't think there's a single asshole on the European team. I'll make – if I'm defending Riggs. Like, who's Thank the asshole know. on Team Europe? That, that dick we Robbie McIntyre. There's, there's very few. Um, I don't know. I, just, I, don't, <laughs> That's what I don't mean, know. like U.S. We can go all day here. Uh, yeah. Europe, Europe's an easier. You know, Riggs is taking the path of least resistance. You know, it's making it even easier for himself. There is nobody to really root against. Nobody. Doesn't it make you excited agree. for the for the storylines though? Brooks oh, and Bryson, sure. yeah. and they. You know, what if they get paired up? And and the idea wow. of Team USA like rallying together and these huge egomaniacs that don't give a fuck about the the country aspect of this of this game. They finally get together, and it's the greatest Ryder Cup of our of my life that I get to witness. That would be awesome. These these are all. This is something that it's set up. We we there's a chance for that. Well, they're but, not. I mean, again, you're sure. almost no chance. You're almost setting it up like it would be this awesome comeback story. Like they're two to one favorites, but you're talking about how like this team has no chance of doing shambles. anything. They're in shambles. That the way that we build this team, we we're two and and seven in our last nine, and we have no chance. We are with this te- right, and I'm saying that like this is there's a chance to turn that around. I understand that the betting favorites because they're the best players in the world, but you're saying that they have no chance because that's not how you build a winning team. You said we need grinders in the corners, not twenty goal scorers. I agree with that. What I'm saying is I think that right what they did and what they're what they're lacked by not picking Kevin Kisser was they could have set a precedent and built something that would win for years and years and years to come and I don't think that they did that. But it's not going to be some if they win on home soil, it's not going to be some like triumphant comeback story. They're 2 to 1 favorites. Oh, you can't have it both ways, man. This is crazy. Like you're setting yourself up for just like no matter what happens, you're right. Like like if they build this team that absolutely stomps Europe, Europe. You're well, I do think I'm to... right. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Like well, forget, that's why forget, you're saying what you're the, saying. Everybody forget forget well, the odds for a second because you, you keep I'm saying what you're saying is wrong. Who, who do you think is going to win the Ryder Cup? Who in your mind is a favorite mix? Because Kevin Kisser's not on the team. So if Kevin Kisser's not on the team, everything falls apart for these Americans. In your mind, this is the this is what you've outlined I'm to us here for the last pills, twenty right? minutes. So who? Well, I'm gonna. Who's the, who's the favorite to win the Ryder Cup in your mind? Golf, playing golf, very cool. It's a weekend coming up, all right? It's uh, Thursday. You guys are listening to this. You're going to want to book tee times from Friday for Saturday for Sunday. It's the uh, end of summer. It's sort of the beginning of fall or in that time of year. Really, especially in the Northeast, the best time to play golf all year is pretty much upon us. Barstool Golf Time app is the way to do it. Came up with our own application. Okay, you download it on your phone. You can leave reviews. You get discounts on merch for leaving reviews. You can book tee times with the app. You get discounts on merch for doing that. So it's really a no-brainer to use the Barstool Golf Time app. And if you already have the app, go back and look at the photos of golf courses that you've taken. We all know that we all take pictures on the first tees, the 10th tees, all these places that we play. We all take photos. Leave reviews of courses that you've played before. The more reviews that go into the app, the more rewards that you will get. And also, the better the app will be. With more recent reviews in the app, that's just going to make it a much more um, user-friendly experience. That's what I want. I want everyone that's listening to this to go in, find your best pictures, find your best videos, and put them into the app right now. Right. The users are just as much a part of this as we are. More. Uh, yeah, I would argue more. Yeah. We we set it up. We decided what it was going to look like. But now it's up to you guys to go out there, golf, and then reflect on your experience and put your pictures and reviews into the Barcel Golf Time app and make it the best tee time app on the planet. Just like we did for pizza with the One Bite app, make this, the Barcel Golf Time app, the number one place to go see how a golf course is like most recently. Cause all, if you go to their website, they're going to give you fucking candy, cane, candy canes and gumdrops and rainbows. They're going to act like it's 2002 again when they first opened. It's 2021. You don't know how that course is. You Let us know. Trust the users. You earn more points when you leave a video review. So leave videos, leave photos. I know you're taking them out there. Like Frankie said, it's 2021. We all do that. I actually use our own app. 
pretty much every day. I got to film these videos, whether it's Dan and I, whether it's Rage Verse. I'm in a new city. I travel a lot. I just whip up the app, uh, find what people are saying. Uh, three and a half stars, four stars, certain price point. That's where the people play. Barstool Golf Time gives you all the information. You can earn all kinds of rewards points. Use those rewards on the rewards program to get discounted merch, tee times, all kinds of good stuff. So go download the Barstool Golf Time app and book your tee times today. I'm going to bet on the European team. I think so the European so, team is. So going in your to mind, it would be an upset if the Americans won. Well, I'm like I'm very clearly aware that their Vegas sets all these lines based no, on no, no, tons no. I'm of saying, different forget, things. Forget I'm saying for me, Vegas. yes, I think the European oh, team's Riggs, going to win. You've been arguing that, that USA has like no chance to win unless they they put Kevin Kisner in for the last like four weeks. What am I taking crazy pills right now? No, You're, let's say there's no Vegas. There's no Vegas rings. Who are you? Who who do you think is no odds? Nothing. It's I think Europe team. is going to win the Ryder Cup. Yes. Okay, there you I, go. I, the only thing I'm t- dispelling from what Frankie's saying is that, like, I don't like, I don't think there's going to be some narrative. I think it's going to be if the U.S. does win. I, I'm not my personal narrative. I think the general narrative around people on Twitter, people on social, people in the media is going to be like a more of a who we like who we won when we were but not like this this awesome uh, 1980 miracle on ice thing. I think it's going to be much more of like, oh, we didn't lose one. Like, thank well, God. Now, That's now the, you're trying to predict the, the future, what you said. We, you just, we can't predict the future. You just, I was I just think asked we, to. I, I think was just gonna, asked to. I think it's going to be fucking awesome if they win, and it's going to be uh, uh, a culmination of everything that people think is not going to happen. Everyone thinks that Bryson DeChambeau and Brooks Kepka and all of these horrible um, personalities are not going to be able to mesh, and you're the one that's leading that argument and that debate. And I think if they overcome those things and they all care and they all play well, it's going to be an amazing accomplishment because you very clearly think that they have no chance. Yeah, I think their chemistry is going to hinder their ability to win. One guy skill wise, either. they should be winning. Okay. Yeah, I think one guy would help. I think like, yeah. bringing a guy in one out of twelve would really help that chemistry. Yeah, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Who do you think is going to win, Kirk? Uh, Europe. I think Europe's going to win. I think they're better. I mean, I, I just like the, I like the team better. I think you know, and you got to remember, like the Europeans won't be afraid to just play fucking you know, eight guys either. Like they're, they're, you know, they're not going to necessarily play all 12 all the time. I do wonder how Stricker is going to battle with that, but you know, you have some potential of some pretty good pairings too. When you look at Europe, I just think like, I think this idea that, and I know the rankings are what they are, but this idea that the U S team is this much better. We do this every two years. At some point we have to say, this isn't really the case. I mean, you have, you have, you have a pretty loaded European team, particularly like one through six and one through seven. I think basically just as good as the American team, especially with Kepka being, where he is right now. I think Europe is like, you know, forget like this, the idea of Sarina Cup. This, this is a really good team. They have, they have a shitload of good players this time. I agree. Yeah. They do. Um, yeah, I mean, the the European team, so uh, Patrick Harrington said Sergio, Ian Poulter are in pole position to make the um, have to pick Ryder that. Cup team. You pick that. I think you have to too, right? Yeah. Yeah. No question. Um. The first five automatic qualifiers um, are Paul Casey, Tommy Fleetwood, Victor Hovland, Rory McIlroy, and John Rahm. Like you said, that, I mean, those five guys right there. Are- That's the other thing. They have, they have clearly the best player in the world right now, too, by a mile right now. It's not even like, – this isn't even a conversation. Like, he is the best player in the world by, by a mile. And then you've got Tyrrell Hatton, who fell off a little bit this year. But, I mean, last year he got to rank like eighth in the world, I want to say. Right. Um, Matthew Fitzpatrick, who we're very familiar with. Lee Westwood, who's played much better over the last year and a half, two years. Shane Lowry, Henrik Stenson, Justin Rose, all in contention with Garcia and Poulter seemingly set to make the team as captain's pick. So, like you said, like when you go through that roster and you and you compare, you know, I mean, they're a little older, sure, but they're old with, with winning history and chemistry. And everything else. So, um, I mean, yeah, even I, just listing the names of all both teams, it's just it's going to be very fun to watch them play. And I will say, if the U.S. loses this, like they, you know, you know, they overreact all the time. If they lose this with this team at that course, set up the way it's going to be set up for the Americans with no European fans there, it is going to be a shitstorm. I will say they are going to do. They're going to have some other new committee and do the same shit all over again. This is going to be. Uh, as bad a loss as they've had because, I mean, it is set up for them to win this time. There's no question about it. I don't think they will, but that's going to be the reaction to it. Frankie, you like like misery and chaos. Isn't a little party rooting for that? Isn't a little party no. rooting for Maybe if I was watching at home. Like the I'd U.S. Want, like, 
Do you Dude, we're gonna be like, there. No, absolutely not. We're gonna be there. I'm gonna get swept up in the theatrics and the patriotism. You think you're I'm, gonna you're gonna cry at some oh, point? Oh, for sure, yeah. dude. The first tee shot, like, like are you kidding me? No. The first tee ball that goes off and the crowd's going fucking crazy and you're gonna be stomping your feet being like, Where's Tommy Fleetwood? <laughs> <laughs> Like Dustin Johnson's gonna go up there and stripe a ball. Pauline is gonna it's be not in the realistic. Crowd. Like, I'm gonna be stopping ball like feet. this. Yeah. Like we're all gonna be waving the American flag, thanking the troops and shit. Oh, oh don't don't invoke the fun. troops. By the like, way, that's thank you fair. everyone that you know. Yeah, I'm an American, so. Yep. Same. Yeah, so am I. Thank you everybody for their service. Absolutely. But, you know. hey, are you thinking about renouncing your citizenship at all? I is think you should. I was saying he should have to move no. to Europe. Maybe spend a year in like the worst spot in Europe if if the Americans win. You guys, maybe you two can select that spot and you have to spend a year there. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. That'd That's the funny. kind of thing. I mean, if you're really, I mean, you're a European. At some point, you got to embrace this thing. Um, I'm not a European, and I believe based on COVID restrictions, that's not reasonable oh, right now. So I'm just trying. You can to make save. that happen. I mean, you. I mean, I've never seen somebody dance around this like you have, though. I mean, you have one foot in and one foot out. I mean, that's sort of. I don't. I'm rooting for oh, the European no. Ryder Cup team. That doesn't mean I'm enlisting in the European Kirk like, sees it. Kirk sees uh, it. army. I mean, you're either, but you're, uh, yeah, but you've it's gone a golf so team. far. In. It's a golf team. Oh, you know? see, that's another one, man. Sad man. What? You, you managed. Just... You, you've managed. I give you credit. You've managed to give yourself this cone of protection. No matter what happens, you have an out for it. I admire it. But it is so, you know, baked in bullshit that it's hard to even have this conversation. If the Americans went, oh, the favorites. If Europeans went, oh, fuck you. If Daniel Berger sucks, oh, I told you. If Daniel Berger is great, oh, what are you going to do? You know, I, it's 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 an interesting. I'm not really sure why you're doing it, but it's an interesting move. I'll give you that. He backed himself into a corner, and it's you. I don't think your heart is really behind it, but you have. Oh, to that, no, that's exactly right, Frankie. That's you crystallized it perfectly. That's exactly right. Crystallized it. That's a nice word. Um, he doesn't wake up and think he team Europe. You know, he, he's an he's an, a diehard American golf fan, and he has to now root for Team Europe, and it's got to kill him every all, single all, day. All, all square Sunday afternoon. Oh my god! Matches are tied. Eleventh. We'll say eleventh singles match. We'll call it. Uh, who we got? Uh, we'll say Brooks Kepka versus Sergio Garcia. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both in the 18th fairway. Uh, you are rooting for Sergio to, to stuff one in there and get the win. If I have money on Europe, absolutely. Oh, it's always a, a little you're, caveat. You're, you're, There's yeah. always something going on. Oh, yeah. being well, I'm going to bet on Europe. Own it, like, dude. Own it's it. Like you're, it's like you're being deposed in court here. Like I'm, I'm, I'm asking you what your what your gut feeling is. Because if you actually. The, Sorry, Kirk. But you guys are also you're trying to you're trying to pinpoint something that you already know. Like I I clearly try I took a risk by making a stance and trying to draw a ton of attention to the fact that we wanted Kevin Kisner. I said that on this show. I no, took but a the, risk. You guys all what, understand that. No, but what you should have what you should have said if you're really into this to that question that Kirk asked was not oh if I bet on him that's what I want. It's that I want Team USA to lose because then it creates chaos and that creates change. Right. I'm I'm for that. I'm all for that. Yeah, but you now you're now you're saying no. Oh, I put money on him. No, I'm for that too. But what I I, <laughs> I think the you, again, you guys know like the answer. You everybody knows how we got to this point. I don't think that's like that hidden. We want to hear you say it. You also you yeah, got to know your, you do. I you got to get you your you got to get your reasoning it. straight. Because right now they're all over. There's a lot of different reasons clearly going on. And like I said, I think that there's a part of everyone that wants to see a little chaos at the end. I think that like Brooks and Bryce, I think that the press conference with Phil and Tom Watson, like I think people loved that. I think everyone was like, holy shit, what's going on here? Didn't you think that was awesome, Kirk? Awesome. That was my, I, I watch it on YouTube probably three times a year. I loved it. <laughs> I fucking loved it. It was great. It, it was, was great. Insane. I'll never understand why Watson, it made no sense. Phil sounded like a baby. It was tremendous. But it also, you know, I thought defined perfectly the American golfer and the entitlement that's involved with it. Like it was it was perfect. Everything about it was perfect. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was great. You know what? It's gonna happen. Everyone likes Stricker, so it's not gonna happen like that. But when they lose, like I said, they're gonna go meet, they're gonna come up with some other idea, and they're gonna have that stupid fucking committee, and they're gonna come out and they're gonna say, Oh, here's our twenty twenty three captain. Ladies and gentlemen, it's fucking Zach Johnson. And it's like oh. we're doing this shit all over again. Like it, they, oh. they, they, they can't help themselves. 
Which is what I'm rooting for. Yes, I agree with that. That is, I would very much enjoy that because A, I'd be able to claim that I was right. And B, we'd be able to watch all sorts of chaos unfold. Like, I remember standing in the Paris airport and we were screaming on the on the phone with each other about the chaos about Patrick Reed and calling into the New York Times and what his wife was saying to the New York team, Times, right? That shit's fantastic. I mean, I, don't, I know rooting for a team, but like then you had Tommy Fleetwood and Francesco Molinari were like sleeping in bed with the, with the Ryder Cup together and posted funny videos and then the other end of it was complete and utter chaos of people leaking shit to the media trying to drag other folks like yeah overall that is now what i'm rooting for overall. there you go you got your ducks in a row now uh roman swipes okay clinically proven way to last longer in bed which is the goal you want to be a stallion you want to be looked at as a, a stud you want to not only be looked at but you want to enjoy this fine intimate moment that you have found yourself in You've done all of these, all of these things, right? You think about it throughout a lot of your life. You you make decisions based upon this fun activity called sex. And now that you've gotten to this moment, do you just want it to uh, end? You want it to finish in two seconds? Got right. It. You you work out. You exercise. You get haircuts. You you trim your facial hair. You can say these are for a, a multitude of reasons, but I think we all know the number one reason, and that is to enjoy a sexual experience with another person. And like Riggs is saying, once that begins once that magic moment starts to happen you want that magic moment to happen for as long as it possibly can and that is where roman swipes comes in to help you dick swipes dick swipes yeah and they help they're you. effective they're easy to use they're fast acting they do not require a prescription you just take the swipes out of the packet you swipe it on you let it dry and you are good to go that is it i'm showing these guys right now what these uh, little packets look like um these are pretty discreet would you say so gentlemen very discreet discreet Yep, yeah, that's the right. Right. I don't even know what it is. Yep, pull them right out of here. Swipe them on your dick there, and then you just last for a long time. It's great. Go to getroman.com slash four. You get your first month of swipes for just five bucks when you choose a monthly plan. That is getroman.com slash four. Well, let me ask Trent, let me ask Trent and Frankie this question: If the Americans win and win comfortably, will there be a photograph of Riggs? on that Sunday that completely invalidates everything you said in the last 40 yeah. seconds. No, no, yeah, I agree completely. We're going to try to not let that happen. Right. Um, I actually oh, may yeah. try. I'm going to try and lean him into it so that we can post that. Oh, it's, like Grinnell, it's like Grinelli celebrating with the Blues after they stomped the fuck. <laughs> <Grinnell. laughs> it's definitely going to happen. It's some, I think honest. so, too. I think so, too. True, it does look worse if he's in there. So much worse. Get in there. You know what? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> wait to take that video and that picture of him hoisting up the fucking rack. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Holy I cannot fuck. wait for Europe to win. I can't wait for there to be utter total chaos and turmoil afterwards. And, Kurt, like you said, it is just waiting to burst through. It is waiting to happen. It's been building up to this, and it's the perfect scenario for there to be total chaos. Total chaos. No question. And I, and I, I just don't know... I don't know who the bad guys. The easy person to say is Bryson. I just, I, I just don't know who, how it's going to happen. Reed not being there actually helps, but I don't know who that's going to be. I don't know who the Mickelson Reed is going to be. This Bryson's almost too easy a pick. I, somebody's sneaking it there. I don't know who it is. Yeah, but he can't help it. He can't help himself. That's true. Like he's, that's true. he's going to be asked something, and the media knows it. And he's especially like some European fucking journalist is going to be in there, and they're going to ask the right question, and Bryson's just going to say something ridiculous like my yeah well my teammates ball sucks so i could you know and then it's just gonna be right. an absolute it's gonna be great when bryson goes like oh two and two they lose by like three points there's a shit storm and he's dry he's flying out to the long drive championship which is the next day it's gonna be, it's gonna be great I mean, that is gonna be fantastic yep it, i mean it's very exciting it's overall very exciting do you guys frankie trent you guys confident usa is gonna win you like the picks yes Love the picks. Scotty Scheffler, I'm going to send him a little uh, American flag emoji uh, via DMs because we're now friends after what happened uh, when we were at Liberty National. So, yeah, I'm very confident in this team. They're the best players in the world. Um, John Rahm scares me a little bit. I'm going to say that. John Rahm being on the opposing side is scary because that guy is just nails. It's very hard to just beat John Rahm in anything related to golf and the sport of golf and the game of golf. Um but I'm I'm confident, man. I mean, this is these are our guys. When you think of Team USA, this is this is the team that we're gonna put out there. It's the big names. It's Dustin Johnson. It's Brooks Kepka. It's Jordan Spieth. I'm very excited to watch them play. I think they're gonna rally around each other. I think you've done a great job of of 
putting you know bulletin board material in front of these guys and I'm very very excited I am very very excited for this team I think they're going to be hungry and they're not going to want to be embarrassed on home soil and whistling straights is going to be fucking awesome it's going to be amazing yeah do we know anything about the fans? Are the fans like uh, we capacity? Where where's Wisconsin at? With I don't that? know that I've. I haven't seen anything, so I don't know. I, I think they're don't... just ignoring it until like right be. after, and then they're going to be like, "All right, we got to shut some stuff down." Might be big for the state of Wisconsin. What do you think of Whistling Straits, Kirk? You got any thoughts on Whistling Straits? Yeah, I like. I like it. It's not my favorite, but I like. It. I think it's good. It's listen for the Americans. It's a great Ryder Cup stuff. They, they don't. I actually liked. Like a sort of a U.S. Open kind of setup, like it was at Inverness last week for the Solheim Cup. I like that for for events. I like when you have to make pars and the course is super tough. Is, these birdie fests can be a little much, but uh, but it's fine. Like I wouldn't say it's one of my favorite courses. Um, I forget where it is in four years. I know in two years it's a, essentially a new course. Which Beth Page Black. Beth Page. Oh right, Black. that's right. Mickelson will be the captain there at Beth Page. Uh, I remember, yeah, the, the the one in Italy, which is in two years, is brand new. I watched that over the weekend because they just played there. But like, I, I I wish they picked sort of more classical courses where you had to where par meant something. That, but that's where I watch Ryder Cup as. I agree with that. I thought the Solheim Cup was very good for that because, like you said, par meant a lot more. Whereas a lot of times you see, and that's kind of what the Europeans. Did. I mean, Le Golf National. I think oh, Patrick sure. Reed shot eighty. He shot eighty five one day at Le Golf right. National. Right. Yeah, Kisser would have been, would have been great there. Yeah. Um. Yes, that one would have made like complete and total sense. They still didn't pick them, so that just infuriates right. me, and we lost. But um, Beth Page Black, I'm curious what you think. If you're so PGA of America, right? They they cycle through sort of their chair, or whatever the fuck they call it, who ultimately like oversees the committee that like basically picks the captains for the Ryder Cup teams. Um, if you're the cat, if you're that person, and 2026 Beth Page Black. Both Tiger Woods, who won there, the 2002 U.S. Open, and Phil Mickelson tell you they want to be captain. Who are you picking? I mean, I, I uh, oof. Tiger's going to win that battle. I, I would like Phil's. First of all, Phil's so much older that you know. I know Tiger's got all the wear and tear, but Phil's so much older. You have to say the Tiger. You know, at that point, Phil will be 54, 53. You got to say, listen, this is this is his time. I don't know if Tiger wanted to be captain on the road. That's the only thing. Like, I don't know where it is two years after that. That's a good question. The weird captaincy to me is in two years because that is, like, wide-ass open because there's really nobody that fits. You know, Mickelson wants to be captain at Beth Page. Tiger's not going to be captain in two years in Italy. I don't know. Maybe somebody will pop – and I know speculating about the captain two years from now is not that big of a deal. Maybe they go, like, randomly. Maybe they go with, like, a Fred Couples or something to kind of pacify over two years. I don't know, but yeah, if it came down to Tiger, Phil, Tiger's going to win that. But I don't, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen to you. I do. Oh, you I do. I like do. that. See yeah. that? I like that's old fashioned Tiger Phil chaos. I'm for that. Yep, I think that that's going to be a final dick measuring contest between Tiger and Phil. I think Tiger, because if you really like, you said look at it. So they're going to Rome in 2023, which Kirk's right. There's no history there. There's no real connection for anybody in the U.S. in terms of captaincy there. So what they decide to do will probably be dictated a lot by like how this uh, Ryder Cup goes. Right. I would guess. In terms of they pick like a blah, like Zach Johnson or something like yeah, that. Do it. Um, but then you've got, um, they're going to um, Adair Manor in Ireland in 2027, which Ireland could be kind of cool. I could see like there's clearly some character and history there. Um, but then they're at Hazeltine again in 2029. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. So it's almost like, I don't know, is there is there someone like Midwestern that's going to get a nod or that would get the – because I, I can't see of those four choices. Okay, you got Hazeltine, you got Ireland, you got Beth Page Black, and you've got Rome. Tiger Woods has got his fucking sights set on where he won a major championship, which is going to be Beth Page Black, I think. Yeah, Phil's quirky. I mean, if Phil want to do Ireland. Who the hell knows, right? I don't know. You know I, I, but, I mean, yeah, it's it, – you know, in a perfect world, if Tiger wasn't going through all this stuff, you'd say, yeah, four years from now, he could still play. In. And I know, obviously, you think he's going to play in the next three Ryder Cups. But, yeah, I think that would be an interesting one. But I can't Tiger, believe people going, don't think that. Tiger is going to win that battle against Phil. No, if it comes down to that, that would be a great behind-the-scenes thing. I, I'm all – I am fucking in on that. Have you decided an exit plan to this Team Europe fandom, rigs? Like, does it extend into – into Rome? Does it extend to Beth Page Black? If, if the same bullshit keeps happening, if Kevin Kisner keeps getting left yeah. off of Great Ryder question. Cup teams, um, where does this end? 
No, I don't really have much of a plan. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, that was honest. You've painted a, you've painted, you've painted a couple of scenarios, Frankie. You again, where if a team rallies around and there's bulletin board material and this U.S. squad has this phenomenal chemistry, um, what kind of place that would leave me in? You know, it could be confusing. It could be optimistic. It could be something I take credit for. Um, and then if they falter and they get, you know, they get defeated on home soil with a as a massive favorite per Vegas, um, per the Barstool Sportsbook, people should go check that out. And there's inevitable chaos afterwards and turmoil and infighting. You know, that may solidify me as a, I, I don't really know what, what's going to happen. Well, that's why they play the game. And that's why sports is the best, uh, you know, live live show reality TV that there is. We'll see what happens. Jesus, what a babbling non-answer that was. It's <laughs> crazy. I mean, that is like. You're asking me that, to predict the future. I don't understand. Is there a gun pointed in your dick that I don't, that, that I don't see? I mean, what, what, is somebody going to shoot you if, you if you answer these <laughs> questions? Like what? You know, I've seen exit plans this bad before, and we saw a couple of weeks ago what happens when exit plans are happened like this. I mean, <laughs> oh fuck, Jesus! Just so you're going to ride with Europe until the U.S. figures their shit out, go on the record with something in this conversation of substance. Just say that. Just say that. You asked me to predict the future. I don't fucking know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Okay, That's impossible. If, if, I, well, oh, tell me exactly. I don't even know where I'm going to live like next month. That's how I pretty much operate if, my entire if, life. If and now US, you're like, tell me exactly what your heart's going to feel like in one month. I don't. If the US, know. if the U.S. loses and there's no chemistry and there's a fall, it's a disaster. And they don't pick Kisner two years from now. It's the same shit I will over. Again. Absolutely, be on the Ryder, the European Ryder Cup band. You will be, you will be Italian rigs. In two years in Italy. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be. Mozzarella, eh, Frankie? That would be, hurt, uh, you know. Exactly. That, that'd hurt, that would hurt. That would be, that'd be a week. That's a good point. Part of. Think of that. Jesus, that's true. That's going to be Francesca Absolutely. Molinari's fucking Ryder Cup anyway. We'll be in Rome. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, it be All great. wine flowing. I'll go to that. I'll still root for USA, but I'll go to that. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, I think that's probably accurate. But again, I can't predict the future. So we'll, I'm not 100%. Like, we'll see. Right. How many times do you think of this podcast, Riggs said he can't predict the future? I know. Oh, and that, that's like what we do on the podcast. Like, oh, who do you think is going to win next week? Like, I don't know. I don't, I know about, oh, I don't know about you guys, Frankie, Trent. Can, can you guys predict the future? Because I can't either. Like, I don't oh, know I mean, anybody. I don't think I can. No. Yeah, I don't think I know anybody. We literally predict the future with Tiger Woods like every single day. Like, oh, you think he's going to come back and win majors? We're like, yeah, I think he is. Like. We have no idea what he's going to do. No future. I guess what I'm saying is like you can't predict how you're going to feel. Like I don't know how I'm going to feel about until I feel that. I don't know. Oh, do I know? Do I think I'm going to be an Islander fan next year? Let me see. Yeah, I think I'm going to be an Islander fan, but I can't predict the future. Something could happen. I don't know. I mean, this is insane. Like you can't predict like, I mean, thinking about the future is not like predicting the future. We're just asking you your opinion. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, but I guess I'm saying like, okay, if the Islanders all became terrorists and started murdering people, would you still be a uh, Islander fan? I mean, it's tough, but like, listen, I'd have to fucking think. Well, about I don't it. know. Pick an answer. Pick an I'd answer. I'd have to think what about it. Yeah, I'll probably be an Islander fan. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, probably, but that <laughs> wasn't a clear answer. These colors don't like, bleed. I don't man. know. You know what? If they turn into fucking terrorists, I don't know. Like, that's just something that they decided to do, but I'm still see an See what happens fan. to the cap, you know? Yeah, you got to see what happens to that fucking. T- <laughs> <laughs> it's tough, man. Hey, Kirk, before you go, I want to say uh, I appreciate all the support you gave Breaking 100. I know you talked about it on your show a lot. I saw you retweeting it. I really appreciate that. That was great. I enjoyed it. And it's funny. I was actually going to mention earlier, if you want to do the chemistry thing, like watching you and Frankie or you and Riggs in the cart is a close approximation of European chemistry versus the American chemistry. If, if it would just be two guys in the cart and Kepka would say to uh, Dustin Johnson, you know, if he's trying to break 100, like, yeah, I think that's 94. And then they would just like drive the cart for yeah. like 50 minutes and say nothing to each other. Right. So I think there is something like, I'm I'm not a huge chemistry guy. Like obviously, I don't have a lot of friends, but I uh, but I think there is like there is something to it. And seeing you guys you know, bullshitting and having a good time, like I get what Riggs is saying. In Europe, has that they just they just have look. Can I predict the future? No, I can't. <laughs> but I do think the chemistry that, that you're going to see uh, is good. that that will play some factor, you know. But yeah, it was awesome. It was it was I was happy to retweet. It was great content. Speaking of uh, like breaking 100 and goals, have uh, how's your game been recently? You know, have you been out okay. there this year? Have you been playing a lot? Not a lot, but you know, my problem, Frankie, is the same problem as always. I just fucking I don't hit it far, and it's frustrating. Like no. I, you know, like 225, 230, and like at best. And so I'm playing these holes, and I'm in, and now I'm I'll be 47 next month, and it's freaking getting harder. Like you know, it's it's 
I'm not getting better. And that's, and I don't think I'm ever going to get, I'm at the age now where I don't think I'm ever going to get better. And like, it's over. So now it's just going to kind of be like this. And I'm going to be that 85 year old guy hitting a driver at a par three course. And it's like, well, what the fuck am I doing? You know, I, I'm, I'm seeing the end already. And that's, I, I shouldn't be thinking like that. As a non friends guy, like who do you play with? Do you just go out by yourself? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like playing by it. You do too, right? I mean, you can't beat it. Like at night, five. Yeah, I do. Actually, talk at night true. in the summer. Like I'll play with my, my brother just moved. I play with him a lot. You know, people ask me. Does to Harry play, play? Does Harry play? Oh, a little bit. But he's so young. Like he'll go out. We went to the range last night. But I have like people who reach out, want to play. But like, I don't want to play with somebody I don't really know. There's fucking nothing worse than that. Like nothing, no. you know. Uh, but no, like, you know, and I'm not I, in a perfect world. Like I like playing 12 holes, 18 holes is a lot. Like I get kind of by fourteen or fifteen, I'm kind of checking out. So, but I haven't played a lot. If you guys play a lot this, I know Riggs has, but if you guys play a lot this summer, yeah, we. Uh, I mean, during the break one hundred thing, we were lot. playing a lot. Oh yeah, then, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then I mean, since then it's cooled off a little it's bit. Probably but, about a round a week or something like that, average for the year. But yeah, you know, it's amazing though when you play a lot. Just you get you get into that groove, man. It's it's, it's amazing that practice really does help you in this fucking game. And like a lot of people don't practice it. Like I mean, we're seeing it with Riggs. What's your handicap down to right now? Going into we're going to Bandon um, on Saturday. Um, lowest it's ever been for sure. I want to say I'm like a 2.1, I think. Holy Dude. shit, is that true? And I've been playing to it. Like, I would say even when I was a six, I probably five or six, I probably played to my handicap less than I do now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just been hitting it wow. so good. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, so yeah, I'm telling you, Kirk is one fucking swing tip. This whole thought of just sitting in a goddamn chair in my backswing, and I just hit the ball so much better. I still have. I think last week I did post like an 87, but it doesn't even change my handicap because it's eight right. of the top 20 or whatever. So it didn't right. even affect my handicap. And then I've just posted a lot of scores in the side. I've been playing pretty fucking good. So I imagine it'll come crumbling down at some point. Um, yeah, I've been yeah, stuck. Game's been I've been hard. stuck at uh, like eight, 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 six for the last couple of years, and I just you just. Is not going down. That's kind of who I am, which is okay. I mean, it's, it's a nice fine. place to be. Actually, you get strokes. And you have the yeah. ability to shoot that low eighty, high seventy day once in a while. Shock the world. I like Correct. that. That's where I'm at yeah. right now. Yeah, I can Dude, live it's, with it. It's it's weird because I would always um, argue and bitch as I do that like when I was a five or six, that was the worst handicap you could be because you're always kind of giving people strokes and you're really not that good. Like you kind of, you don't really make many birdies and you kind of like slap dick it around and shoot low eighties or something. Right. And that's like occasional seven. But I actually, am, I think I'm better in matches now as a lower handicap because I think I actually like play, you play sure. golf well. So yeah. I think I'm, I actually prefer now the handicap to what I like win more matches. I think now as a two or whatever than I did as a six, which is weird. Kirk, what are your thoughts on Brooks versus Dave? I know that we had to reschedule it. Brooks, you know, hit a root. So we were we were going to play yesterday. I was bummed that we didn't get to do it. But what were your thoughts going into that match? I was looking forward to it. I, I was, I was, I picked Kepka on the show. Uh, but I was, yeah, it would have been, uh, I thought it would have gone a long way too for Kepka. Like I'm, I'm so indifferent on Kepka. It was good to watch him in that environment. Was there ever any talk of somebody filling in for him or no? That was never going to no, happen. No, I don't think so. Because like, a wild if, if if Bryson showed up and played for him. Instead. See, <laughs> we've talked about on this show that would have been the ultimate not not to play for him, but just to show up to the event would have squashed all the beef. It would, he would have Absolutely. finally been in on the joke. He would have finally said, "All right, I can joke around with you guys. I'm not this like socially inept person that can't like take a joke or can't like respond to anyone in like a human fashion." Right. Um, but of course, he just didn't. I think him and Dave actually had a conversation about doing it, and then it never went anywhere in classic Bryson fashion. Um, you think I and I have no – like, I have, I've seen other places talk. I just have no patience for this idea that Bryson's being bullied on these courses. I mean, give me a fucking break. I, I, it's, it's, the, it's, it's absurd. It's insane, absurd. He can make it go away. You got Roger Malpe yelling at people. In the, I mean, what are, what are we doing here? Like, you want to grow this thing or not? Like, I, I've seen athletes being harassed before. Somebody calling – saying uh, 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 Brooksy to Bryson DeChambeau by any definition is nowhere near that. It's insane. Do Nuts. you think the amount that it was happening, though, got to a point no. where there's nothing he can do? I mean, you got to think about every single hole, every single tournament, every single course. It's a it's a person's first time screaming Brooksy. It was nonstop. It was it was a never ending Brooksy. Do you think do you think that if DeChambeau walked up to the first tee at one of these tournaments with like a Brooksy shirt with like Kepka's face on it or something, it would be totally gone. Like right. you said about showing up. Right. But, but I guess also 
he just wa- his brain is not wired to think he's not built to think like that that no. is never going to happen and that's sort of the curse and the beauty of DeChambeau, who is like so needed in golf it, like i know people hate him imagine if he wasn't in golf right now like right. It, it would suck it's great that he's in golf it's the greatest yeah i can't yeah. wait to see him fucking do something stupid at the Ryder Cup and then do something <laughs> great like i can't, i yeah. cannot wait he's can't a wait. headline machine, machine. He just he keeps is. making headlines he great. is you know it something is funny. Else is going to happen Mm-hmm. If you sucked out Bryson and Brooks from the golf, professional golf sphere, like what would have been talked about this year? There'd be a few moments, Phil winning, like there'd be, but uh, like there's, what would the normal conversation week by week have been about? Ugh. I don't know. John Rahm being really good. He was born with like <laughs> weird feet. That's kind of it. That like, came out this year. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, no, it would be a whole different thing. So, yeah, from a headline, from an eyeball's perspective, it, no, nothing's better. Hmm. It's weird. Golf needed it. Uh, Kirk, is uh, Justin back yet? Uh, no, Justin's not back yet. He's still on uh, his leave after costing me uh, $29,000 in catering bill for my last live show, which is something I still can't believe happened. I, I'm still intellectually battling that. So, no, he's, it was usual at our show. It's, you know. Disaster after disaster, but we we uh, we plunge along slowly. I think it's an unthinkable number. I I even talked about it with my dad. Like, it's what, staggering. But is it is? And I know Dave mentioned this on Dave Portnoy's show. Is any of it on the caterer to be like, why am I driving eight hours? I mean, I guess. But uh, like, the way I looked at it was, you know, qu- just quickly, like, you know, we did a live show up in Maine, and we did one up in Maine like a month before that. And somebody showed up and because I got into a fight with the guy who owned the pizza place in Madawaska, Maine, for <laughs> reasons that we don't need to get into. So somebody filled in and catered the show uh, in front of like 150 people. This was like thousands of people at the other one. And my producer, Justin, my whatever intern, had a caterer drive 600 miles to, to a drive in movie theater and cater the entire event. I thought it was a food truck. The bill came, it was $29,700. So, I mean, I guess, Frankie, yes. Like, in a perfect world, if we're going to assign some blame, sure. But it's all on us. Like, you, right. have, to, you have to say. <laughs> you understand, like, the, the, the fans are paying for a fucking hot dog. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were scallops <laughs> wrapped in bacon at this event. For a thousand, like, 1,200 people were there. It was, I could, when my producer, Dave Cullinan, said, you're not going to believe this bill, I was like, Oh my God! Do we owe like three thousand dollars? And he said twenty nine thousand dollars. You could have knocked me over with an eyelash. I was. In, I'm still in shock. I'm, I'm, you're getting me mad about. It. I, I actually hadn't thought about it really today until now because I usually think about it seven or eight times a day. I can't believe it happened. As you guys know, like the way my deal was set up, that that's out of my end. Like Barstool was right. not cutting a check. I just paid thirty thousand dollars so these fat moron fans could stuff their fucking faces. Like I I can't believe it happened. Kirk just hates all the Minna fans, and they're all walking around going, Kirk, did you see? They're handing out bacon wrapped scallops at <laughs> this fucking place. Literally, literally, ba- like, there's scallops with bacon in it. I don't understand. <laughs> that's, so, that's so Barstool. It's crazy. True. Oh it's just, it's so Barstool from the little pod, too, that is like considers themselves a little, a little separate. They kind of do their own thing. And at its core, you guys just fuck up like everybody else. It's the Barstool difference to a T. Um, so Sacco four, I got my shirt, you know, I'm a big supporter over here. I heard you're going to be selling out, right? You're going to be just taking pictures. You're going to be doing dunk takes. What's going on at, uh, the next live show to make up for this complete sellout experience. I wanted my money back. We already got it, but whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever creative ideas people come up with, we'll take them. It's, uh, (laughs) October 2nd. I think there's still some, some tickets left, I think, but yeah, uh, Saturday, first Saturday, October in May, which is actually nice. You cannot pick a better month. Playing golf in Maine, I'll play golf that day with my brother in October. Perfect. That that's like worth the whole trip for me. We'll go up to a play by the ocean a little bit, then go and do the show. So I'm looking nice. forward to that. All I know it's next time I'm going to play. So yeah, perfect. Amazing. I love it. All right, Kirk. Well, um, All right, boys. Ride a couple. Be fun. We appreciate the insight as always. Um, you know, keep up the good work. Good luck in Maine, and uh, we'll have you back on maybe afterwards, and we can see, you know, who was right and if somebody could predict the future and all that. I look forward to it. All right, guys. All See right, ya. Thanks, Kirk. Thanks, Kirk. Thanks, See Kirk. Boys. Thanks. There's big news, ladies and gentlemen, listeners, patrons out there, patrons from my favorite home security company, Simply Safe, just launched launched their new wireless outdoor security camera. That is right. Simply Safe 
the system that U.S. News and World Report names best home security system of 2021 just got even better. This brand new outdoor security camera is engineered with all the advanced tech and security features you want and need to help keep you and your family safe. It has an ultra-wide 140-degree field of view, so you keep watch over your entire yard. It's got 180p HD resolution with an 8 X zoom. That means you can zoom in and clearly see. I just want this camera to be honest with you. I don't Jeez. even really care about. I mean, I, I might use this for filming our videos. Right. I was going to say it's nice to see Simply Safe staying on the cutting edge. That they are. They weren't content with what was going on before. Obviously, it, what they were doing before worked, but now they see that there is a new avenue. This ultra high def eight zoom camera, and they're like, we're adding that to our arsenal because the people need it. Listen to this shit, Trent. It's got a built-in spotlight with color night vision, so you can keep an eye on what's going on day and night. It's super simple to set up, which makes sense because we're talking about Simply Safe. Um, this camera has it all, and it integrates with your Simply Safe home security system, extending its protection to the outside. Wow. This thing sounds awesome. To learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com slash foreplay. What's more, Simply Safe, Simply Safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system with your uh, and your first month of monitoring service free. So you get 20% off entire new system and you get first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. So. Go to simplysafe.com slash foreplay. Again, that is simplysafe.com slash foreplay. You get the new camera. You're going to get the new system by, uh, with 20% off. You're going to get monitoring service your first month free. That's simplysafe.com slash foreplay. Um, well, we'll just hop right in. Um, cool. We got Marty Fish. Um, big time, obviously, uh, star in the tennis world. Retired now. He's got the untold breaking point coming out on Netflix. I was kind of reading through some of this. I think it's September um, 7th, so yesterday that this puppy came out. Uh, is this, you know, I know a lot of, um, there's been a lot of chatter about the Formula One documentary and people that, you know, PGA Tour just announced that they're going to do something based sort of off that. So in terms of kind of the pitch on the show, what are we looking at here? Uh, well, it's a story... Um it's certainly a um, a story of my sort of life upbringing of uh, tennis and how you know how I guess difficult it is to to sort of make it in a in a sport in an individual sport um, uh, and then my struggle with mental health and and how I sort of overcame that and and um, uh, you know tried to just become a success story for someone um, you know the whole reason that I started talking about it was um, because I didn't you know I'm a big sports fan as well and I didn't um, I didn't have a sort of success story to lean on um, to sort of go okay there's an athlete that was that was at a high level struggled with mental health or, or you know some form of that um, and then got back into it and was able to succeed at a high level again and um and so I wanted to be a success story for people that were coming behind me. I mean, we're, we're, you know, struggling with, uh, I struggled with severe anxiety disorder for, um, a long time, still, um, still do to a, to a smaller degree, but, um, you know, I just knew there are more people out there, um, uh, that were struggling as well, um, doing some research on it and, and getting some education on it initially sort of learned that there's tens of millions of people that deal with mental health issues every day, just Americans. So, um, so you're not, a, you know, you're certainly not alone if you're the only one, uh, or if you feel like you're the only one dealing with it. So that was sort of the premise of the story and, and the doc and, and how it came out. And, um, and I think, I think it turned out really well. So Is I was there actually, any, um, Oh, go ahead, Lurch. Sorry, yeah. Lurch is, by the way, our tennis expert. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm the biggest, certainly, tennis fan on the show, and uh, I was actually able to watch it. I didn't. I saw Madison Keys actually tweet about it the other night, and uh, our plane was grounded in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I was like, "Oh, perfect!" So, downloaded on Netflix and gave it a watch. And it's. I mean, I've followed tennis my whole life, and so I've always played, never like competitively, but you know, wherever I could, my brother and I always have a good sibling rivalry match. Um, and was Who obviously huge. Uh, I would say it's neck and neck. He's got a great forehand, but doesn't that feels like so he would say that. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. That's what that <laughs> no, I would say I would say it's very fair to say it's neck and neck. Um, but yeah, there's some curse words that go alongside of it. But anyways, the um, doc on Netflix is like remarkable, and I 
was a youngster growing up, you know, I obviously knew of our top Americans. You were certainly, you know, neck and neck with Roddick, but I didn't know the backstory of you guys living together as kids. And then you rededicating yourself to the game in your late ages to go on this incredible run to, you know, make the ATP finals in London and uh, basically create the world around you of Marty Fish, you know, our top American tennis player. So for anybody out there, it's a must watch. Uh, as it dives into your life. And I had no idea, honestly, the details of it. So uh, I give that just 10 thumbs up. It was really, really well done. I thank you for sharing your story. I thank you for, you know, republicizing the struggles that you went through, right? Those are kind of past you, but you know, your closing line of, you know, I deal with every day and I win every day, I think is truly remarkable. So um, something super special. And I guess, you know, Riggs, I don't know if you want to continue to talk about the, the, tennis, you know, the, the show on Netflix or what the case may be, but I'd be super interested to know, you know, obviously you were just the captain of the Davis cup team, you know, what's your relationship with, with tennis today? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for saying that. And thanks for watching it. I appreciate that. Um, uh, no, uh, today, I mean, I'm, I'm still the Davis cup captain for the U S so we've got, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of, I feel like we say this all the time. We got a lot of young up and coming, like sort of, studs that that either haven't uh, broken through quick uh, as quick as we thought or are you know sort of coming along um coming along right now you know someone like riley opelka is my is favorite a, yeah as a kid that like you know he's an upgraded and I, I, john wouldn't mind me saying this he's an upgraded yep. version of isner you know like he's a tiny bit taller same type of serve, same type of game, a little bit better backhand, maybe not quite as good of a forehand. Isner was a total bulldog on the court. So, you know, in terms of competitiveness and stuff, he he was unmatched almost. Um, but Opelka's kind of got that huge game where you're just like, man, if you can just sort of figure out the, the mental side of it, the competitive side of it. Um, great kid, um, root, root for him like crazy. You know, he's sort of our, our top guy. Sebastian Corda is another one who yeah. – uh, his dad obviously was uh, Peter Corda and won the Australian Open a, a bunch of years ago. And obviously his sister's sister's Jeff, golf podcast. Yeah, exactly. Jeff, Jeff and Nell, <laughs> Nelly. Um, they're just an awesome family, incredible uh, talent in that family. I mean, Sebi could have played, probably could have played golf or, or soccer as well. I mean, he's like a phenomenal at, at pretty much everything. And turns out he's pretty phenomenal at tennis as well. So that's a good thing for me. And, you know, and then we, and then, you know, you sort of, look at the older guys and John Isner and, you know, the Sam queries and Stevie Johnson's, those types of guys are, are winding down, can still play Sam and Stevie are, are in the semis of doubles at us open. So, um, you know, they can certainly still play, but kind of winding down their career. So tennis is in good hands in the U S in terms of um, in terms of up and coming in terms of depth. Um, we don't have the sort of top 10 player that we've, kind of always had um right now specifically but they're coming yeah i think the game and you probably looking back i'd be interested to hear if you know your career and was tumultuous in terms of you know your ranking where you were at and you know where you wanted to be and where you thought you could be certainly there was the McEnroe's, the couriers of the world and then there was you know certainly in your document docu it kind of alluded to the fact of you know who's going to carry the torch for us you know we're hoping it's fish we're hoping it's roddick and now where the game is, when you think about it with, you know, Fritz is another one that you didn't mention, but got upset by Brooksby in this, you know, yeah. in the open. And so is that something you look back on and say, you know, damn, my career was tough. I loved every second of it, but I'm so proud of what Andy and I did in terms of carrying the torch along with a lot of other guys um, to where it is now, because I certainly think we don't have a top 10 player currently but there's just so much to root for in terms of the American youth of tennis and where the game is. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things there. Um, you know, I wouldn't put it on anyone to, to come after the generation that we came after, you know, the Agassiz, yeah. Campers, Courier, Chang. I mean, you can kind of go on and on. They had like five guys in the top 10 at the same time, six guys. Those are the guys I know. Those are the guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, so coming after them, I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it was, difficult, uh, media wise to, uh, you know, Andy jumped out there right away. I mean, obviously he was the alpha male of our generation. So he comes out right away and, 
and wins a, a slam before his 21st birthday or right at his 21st birthday. Um, I finished that year like 15th in the world, something like that. And, and I was 21 as well. So like we were feeling like we were in good shape there. Andy continued it. I didn't. Um, uh, and, and you mentioned part of the doc where, um, you know, initially the beginning of my career, I didn't really, I thought I worked hard enough. I just didn't understand like the actual, you know, the, the total discipline and dedication and professionalism that it took to get everything out of your game, you know, period. And, and I just didn't understand that. I thought when I worked hard, I got tired and I got tired quickly and then I'd stop because I was tired. You know, like that's what I thought was supposed to happen. Preach, so, brother. Preach. <laughs> and oh, yeah. up, and so, uh, you're speaking our language. Yeah. So I, I, I found myself, uh, uh, you know, not heavy walking down the street. Oh, that guy's fat. But like that guy's a professional athlete, like that kind of thing in 2009. And I, I had a knee, I had a, uh, you know, I had to have a knee surgery that was because I was too heavy to be doing what I was doing. Not again, not walking around the street, but like running around for four hours on concrete. And so um, I sort of rededicated myself and said, honestly, had a look in the mirror moment where I was just like, this is your, this is your chance, you know, to like finally lose some weight, get in shape, like really physically get in shape. And I thought I was going to lose 15, 10, 15 pounds, I ended up losing 32 pounds. And so um, it just flew off. Um, I was super disciplined with it. It, it rolled into everything that I did um, on and off the court in my life. Um, you know, stop drinking, stop putting like bad, you know, just kind of crappy things in my body at the time and, um, uh, and, and just sort of reinvented myself. I didn't know where it would take me, but I knew that I was different and a different player, a different body, all that stuff. So, you know, and then, and then finally, like the, you know, coming in the generation that we came in with Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, and, you know, to a certain degree, Murray, um, it was sort of a blessing and a curse, right? Like you're, it's kind of cool to be playing in that generation, you know, with those guys and, you know, nice to say that I beat them, um, once, um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, they beat me a lot and they beat everyone a lot. And so it sort of stunted our, careers a little bit, I guess, with playing with those sort of three or four guys where they're just hogging all the majors, all the big events, you know, those guys. What was confidence? What was confidence like going into matches against those guys? Like, did you in your heart of hearts think you could win? Were there times when you thought you could win? Other times where you went in being like, yeah. all right, boys, I'll see you after the match. We're going out. <laughs> like, how? Like, Honestly, <laughs> I, you had to be I, real. I definitely, I, I didn't play, thank God, I didn't play Rafa on clay. Uh, that would have certainly felt like that, right? Like you going out there and you're like, mm, don't get double bageled here. Um, <laughs> that would be nice to win a couple games. I would probably feel. Uh, um, I played Roger at Wimbledon um, and actually won a set off him, but that was in 2003. It was before he won. His, that was his first major that he'd won, uh, 2003. So, um, you know, so the, but there, there's been time, you know, Djokovic is a guy where, if he's on and you walking out there, you're not walking out there going like, I'm definitely going to lose. You're thinking like, this is going to be tough. I have to play incredibly well. You know, as an athlete, you're like, you know, you're never walking out there going like, I'm going to lose this. This is, this yeah. is gonna be ugly. But <laughs> there are moments in a match where you're just like, holy, can you cuss on this show? Oh, or yeah. No? Oh, yeah. Sure. Actually, actually oh. no. Uh, no, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, holy shit, this is getting ugly here. I play. I also played Roger in 2000, I think it was 2004 final of a, a grass court tune-up tournament in Halle, Germany. And uh, he was up 9-0 in the first, in the first sort of, you know, nine games. And, and um, so 6 3 and I'm thinking to myself, like, this is not good. You know, these people have paid a lot of money to come here and like this stadium's packed and this is supposed to be a final. And like, this is not good. And I guarantee, I swear to this day, I still think Roger let me hold out to, to sort of, you know, because there's, he understands there's sponsorships and like people there and stuff. He's like, I'm not going to lose this guy at, ever. So like, I'm just going to let him hold serve and, We'll, we'll, it'll be six oh six three, and it'll be a comfortable win for me. I'm I'm telling you, I swear to you, that's exactly what happened. He let me win three games in the finals of a grass court event. So you're coming up with those guys sometimes. Uh, sometimes it can be pretty daunting. 
How much do you um, in tennis? Because I don't know. You know, I mean, and I will say that I um, the big matches I think are maybe some of the best television in the world. Like it is so good when guys are evenly matched, when the stakes are really high, when there's the history. You got the Wimbledon and the outfits, and you got the clay and how unique. Like I love that. But on a day to day basis, you know, I like most people not that crazy into it. Mm-hmm. On a on a match by match basis, how much are you genuinely studying? your upcoming opponent, like going into it? Um, so if I haven't seen a lot of them, I'll try and search for some videos like YouTube. I remember, you know, this is kind of before analytics and stuff, you know, so, sort of 2011, 12, sort of that that type of time. Um, if I got somebody in the first round or two at a slam that like, you know, because the grand slams are the biggest draws. They're actually the easiest tournaments to get into. Um, cause their draws are so big. It's 128 draw. Um, so, so you can get some guys there that are, you know, qualifiers or, or, or sort of snuck in because they played a lot on clay and they were good on, you know, some Spaniards or something. So I'd try and look for those guys, um, online, honestly, and ask sort of anyone, look at his previous results and see if any American has played them or kind of anyone that I was close with has played them. I love just Googling like, them. Like, who the fuck is this yeah, guy? All right. Sort of, yeah, <laughs> honestly, like I, I, there's been time, you know, look up the guy's ranking and it's just like, this guy's ranked 340, which is still like a pretty badass tennis player, but like mm-hmm. in our, you know, kind of in our world, you know, it's hard to find him or hard to find a lot of stuff on him. Uh, the other guys, um, I've played so I had played so often or watched so often. It's important. It's it is important to to watch specifically tennis because it's just such a one on one type game. It's not like golf where um, where you sort of playing yourself and playing the course. Um, you're not playing the other 140 guys out there. Uh, you're just like in tennis. You're just out there playing one guy. So you just have to beat one guy that day. Uh, you don't have to beat the entire draw. You'll figure it out after who you play or if you lose, whatever. But like, you just have to figure out that one day. Um, so that's, you know, you kind of get with a coach and you, you know, with your coach and they do their research and if they don't, they're fired and you, uh, and you, <laughs> and you, uh, you, you try to find as much as you can on them. You go back, you watch some of them. I'd, I'd watch some of the matches that I had played that give us a little JPEG back in the day and you plug it into your little computer or whatever. And like, you can, watch previous matches and stuff like that um so that's kind of that's kind of what we did yeah i always find just that really inter- really interesting just kind of the the preparation and i you know i remember uh, like r.i.p but kobe did an interview uh, with big cat and a rod who were two of our big guys and man him going through in detail a year or two ago with those guys about you know how he would study his opponents uh, on a like defensive level how he would play and how often like they would go to their left and if you could get them to go to their left like they're you know whatever 70 percent less likely to make the hook shot or whatever and going through like detail by detail so sure. i'm always fascinated in other sports the different kind of preparation and like you said i imagine analytics change things pretty dramatically i know it has in golf even in the last two or three years with this decade golf and people's core strategy and where their aim and tee shots is based on their kind of like plotting of how far they miss and dispersions i imagine that's changed tennis a lot uh, in terms of preparation level. Well, I didn't know how deep you wanted me to get into it. I mean, I could get into like, the, <laughs> you know, like how we, you know, let's I, go, I, baby. We love this shit. There's certainly there. The, I mean, look. So, so to get to pull back the curtain, then. I mean, we. I would. I would. I would follow guys' patterns. Um, I, first of all, tennis is 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 in, in my opinion all about trying to figure out what you do really well and what you don't do well and try and stay within that margin as best you can and and so trying to try every point like there wasn't a shot that i hit that wasn't on purpose and it looks like when you're out there watching you're like oh they're just striking the ball cross court and then one guy changes <laughs> direction down the line and you know they're <laughs> yelling at umpire no it's like it's a uh, it, every shot is hit on purpose to try and set up, at least for me, try and set up my back end. My back end was my best shot. It was one of, I thought one of the best shots um, uh, in the world in terms of backhands. I, I would put my two handed backhand up with anyone else's backhand in the world at the time when I, when I was playing at a high level. And so I would try and set up my backhand any way possible. Um, so I would develop a, a, a shot, down the line, which was, which took off a little bit of pace, 
but had some height on it and push the guy back a little bit on the court. So then they'd either have to come short. I always tried to get to the net as well. I have good hands and feel at the net. So I, I felt like um, my ground strokes weren't as good as let's say Djokovic, for instance. So I would try and push him back to his backhand side as much as I can, knowing that he's either got to come back to my best shot, my backhand cross court, or if he leaves it a little bit short, I can hit a forehand come to the net. That was sort of how I would try, but everyone's so different, right? Because if I played Nadal, I would try and and open, you know, everyone said like Nadal had this crazy forehand, right? He still has this un- unbelievable forehand, maybe the best forehand of all time. Um, certainly the most powerful and heavy forehand in terms of like the RPMs on the ball pushes you back like crazy. Um, if, if I were, were playing him, you would think you'd want to stay away from his forehand, right? But for me, if I opened up the court on his forehand side, got him over on his forehand side, hitting forehands, as opposed to hitting forehands on the backhand side, where he was just absolutely deadly, um, I could open up the backhand and get it there and then be super comfortable if he's hitting backhand. You're never comfortable if he's hitting forehand. Like these guys are all different. Like I'd play Djokovic different than I'd play Nadal different than I'd play Federer different. Federer hated playing defense. He was all he was, in, he was the most offensive player ever in terms of t- having control of every point. He was not very good. He missed a lot. He actually gave you a lot of points. But when where he was great was he could just turn like an uncomfortable ball for him into a winner like that. And and it was like you, you just he would completely he was like the only guy outside of like the major servers, let's say like Opelka and Isner, these guys that serve 150 miles an hour and just hit like a million aces. Roger would take the racket out of your hand like no one else. And so you couldn't play your style when he was on. And he was just so good. He could hit he would hit shots that you wouldn't even try and practice. And you'd be like, why would he hit that shot? And he'd make it. And that, you know, he was just the talent was just incredible on him. Would you equate it to like he's just firing at flag sticks like all day long in, in golf? <laughs> yeah, work? golf wise, yeah. I mean, so he's like he's like tight fairway. Um, everyone's hitting three wood bomb driver without hesitation. Um, you know, right down the middle. You know, pin tight pin in the corner in the back. Little you know, little swell, whatever. Right, you know go at the pin when everyone's like middle of the green, let it float. Right. You know, something like that. He's just at the pin. Just deadly. <laughs> Amazing. Um, do you think golf or do you think um, like tennis now, you know, I think we've talked about this in a lot of different sports really, but do you think it, it misses rivalries in the sense that clearly like with the top three and we throw Murray in their top four, there's obviously rivalry. I mean, get three guys tied, tied with the most uh, slams yeah. of all time, but um, like, hated rivalries right like i mean my my dad always talks about you know tennis in like the 80s and when these guys fucking hated each other it seemed like and that's sort of what a lot of the matches and you know do you think it, it needs more of that do you think it's the like how, how do you kind of feel about that in terms of just the overall media appeal to tennis nowadays i mean we were lucky that roger and rafa were so great um, for tennis, they're incredible for tennis, but it would have been awesome if one of them was like a total dick, and they're not. You know, like they're they're both so nice. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've kind of always said like Novak should lean into like the the hated guy sort of sort of play. He'd make a ton of money on that. He's already like he's the guy that beats your favorite player every time. So like he's already not going to be liked and he's beating Roger and Rafa most of the time. And if you look at their numbers and stuff, I mean, he, he's most likely going to go down as the, the greatest ever in terms of slams, in terms of record against those guys, in terms of get record against top 10 and stuff like that. Um, and, and so for Roger and Rafa fans, which there are plenty, um, they don't like Novak because he beats them all the time and he's certainly beating them nowadays. And so uh, if he leaned into that like hated guy more than trying to have people like him, cause he's a good dude. He's a good dude. He really is. He's just for people that root for Rafa and Roger, he's hard to root for. Um, they don't like the way he acts on the court or whatever. I mean, every you know, like not everybody can act like Federer on the court. Like he's, uh, I mean, certainly, uh, certainly I couldn't even try. I mean, to, you know, he's, I've seen him throw his racket one time in his entire career. So like, 
he's he's so unique those guys are so he did unique. hit that ball one time though which <laughs> hit What's the ball at the line judge. he did hit that ball that one time at the line judge well that was no <laughs> joker right that was no yeah yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah oh that's right i thought he's talking about federer yeah, oh, so, my yeah so fed's like so well liked he's like i mean he's the equivalent of like Derek jeter going into fenway and getting cheered like I- i've played plenty of matches against him where it's been in the states and they're supposed to be rooting for me and they're just rooting for Roger. And it's like 90, 10, you know, it's not like 50, 60, 40. It's like legit, like 95, five, you know, and you're just like, how does this guy come in here and get all the fans and all, you know, it's like, so he's, he's that he's, he's a Jeter in Fenway, Jeter, Dodger state, like people rooting for him. Um, actually like outwardly rooting, like you would never see that. And so um, they're just so unique, you know, and, and just, I mean, it's, spe- it's special. It's like, a, you know, like I said before, it's a blessing and a curse a little bit. Like they took away lots of, lots of wins for me. They took away a lot of money, but, um, but it was also pretty cool to play them. Yeah. I'd love to see a full heel turn from Joker. That'd be fantastic. It would be right. Like he, he needs to embrace that. Like people don't, don't like him very much and they don't like the way he, he acts on the court and whatever. And like, if he just leaned into that, you know, like he does the injury thing, right. Doesn't he take like injury timeouts all the time? Um, I mean, he used to, he used to do that. He's much better with that now back in like Oh seven, Oh eight kind of thing. Like, yeah, he was, he just lean into that. I agree. He just started like taunting people. Just, they already don't, you know, like don't try and get the crowd on your side anymore. Like let's like, he would honestly be like Mac and or Connors like back then, you know, Connors like was, was gnarly on the court you know like he was spitting at people and he was yelling and cussing at umpires and he was nasty dude but like he was connor's and he loved watching it like joke he's too sensitive like he wants to be liked like you're andy the other night tweeted that um, that that's the problem he's a really nice kid he's a sweet kid like if if i saw him on the street he'd stop and say hi to the kids how's the family you know just like super nice guy um He's just sort of misunderstood, and then people don't like him because he, you know, because he beats their guy. Imagine he walks out to center court, just double bird to the crowd. Yeah. He should. <laughs> Lean into it, man. I'm telling you, he would be a mega star if he did that. Mega star. <laughs> His wife uh, had the shirt. I run with a wolf the other night, and then Andy actually tweeted at him. Andy Roddick tweeted at him saying, first um, Joker takes your legs. Next, he takes your soul." Yeah. And that was bought up in the pros post game presser. And Joker like corrected it because he does want to be liked and he is a good guy. He's like, I don't take people's soul, you know, and like was very polite in the way he accepted yeah. that question. He but, definitely yeah. takes your legs though. He definitely takes your legs. <laughs> yeah. He takes your heart. Amazing. He takes your tennis game. That's for sure. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting you, you say that there's like, uh, cause when we talk about golf and guys, um, you know, playing in the Tiger Woods era and you know they're always very thankful to play in that era because he was able to generate a lot more money for the collective group but tennis seems to be a little bit more the opposite right because it's such a you got to win the event to really rake in the cash I mean we didn't see that huge bump um like Tiger I mean I don't think we'll ever see something like that again right like I mean you know the guy that owes him the most is someone like Phil you know that that and he understands it and he knows it um he appreciates him and, and look, I mean, they, we, we appreciate Roger and Rafa. Yeah. But like we had to play them specifically. It's right. just a little different. Um, yeah. I've been lucky enough to play some mini tour events and golf and stuff and just enter just to have fun with it and everything. And like try and study like the mental side of golf and stuff. And it, it's, it's similar and so different um, at the same time, like in tennis, we're so trained mentally to just stay focused the entire time. If you leave focus, you could lose a couple of points and then all of a sudden you've lost your serve. And then that in turn, you lost the set, you know, against a big server maybe. But in golf, if, you know, I played these, these events early on and, and I was so focused because that was all I trained. That was all how I trained, right? Like I'm focused. I'm never leaving. I'm, my, my mind is in it at all times. You do that for five and a half hours in like a, in like a real round of golf, dude, you are exhausted. I leave the golf course and I'm like, I'm more tired than I was playing a five set match on clay, which makes no sense because we know how physical golf is. So like, uh, so it, in mentally, like I was like really, um, fascinated by both games because they're, um, you know, they're so individual, but, but yet, 
um, uh, so different mentally. Um, so anyways, it's just something to, something to think about. I mean, you're an absolute stick on the golf course too. So like, and I know you grew up in Vero and you're friends with Jake Owen, who's been friendly to us. We've done a few things with him. Yeah. He's been on golf um, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a bit. He's, he's a great, great dude. How's your golf game stack up against his? Oh, I, I mean, think way yeah. better. Yeah, no, he's, yeah. He's, uh, but I mean, we used to play, I mean, we played, we've been best friends since we were five years old, you know? So like we, he and his twin brother, Jared and I, we used to get dropped off in the summer every single day in the summer at this public course called Sandridge in Vero Beach. And it was this shitty golf course that like, I've you know, played public yeah. whatever. you played it? <laughs> yeah, I played it. Dude, I'd give anything to play Sandridge again. Like, I mean, <laughs> But but they would drop us off and it was a dollar seven. It was a dollar plus tax. It was a dollar seven to play nine holes to get a hot dog and chips. And so our parents would drop us off at three o'clock on uh, on every day in the summer, and we'd play nine holes of golf and have a hot dog and chips every single day. And like, I mean, he probably beat me. I don't know, maybe once or twice. <laughs> yeah, I've pl- I've played that because you drive by like red stick yes. and then you get the sand ridge and all you want to do is play red stick i've never played that but then you get the sand ridge and it is a sand ridge like there's limited grass Literally. it's an absolute shit. all sand <laughs> but it's <laughs> awesome man that's where we that's where we grew up playing that's where jake played his golf and you know that's where he learned how to play he's a great player but he's he ain't fish you know <laughs> <laughs> i can't Did- I can't wait to send him a text. Be like, I heard you're a good player, but you're not fish. Tell him that exact fish. thing. Marty said it on <laughs> podcast that he's a great golfer, but he ain't fish. He ain't <laughs> that. That's that so is good. fantastic. That's wow. good. Um, all right, man. Well, we appreciate the time. Um, you know, Untold, Breaking Points on uh, Netflix now, raving reviews from our guy Lurch, our tennis expert. Mm. So, um, so. Yeah, we, we appreciate the time. I don't know if I've yeah. ever heard Lurch talk about anything like that in his life. He was excited. Dude, it's a it's an unreal doc. It's uh I'll be watching. and I was just a kid. Say again. I said I'll be watching. I love it. Yeah, no, as a kid, I mean I was thought I knew a lot of about what was going on in the tennis world and had no idea really of your whole story, honestly. So super super cool, um, and just super interesting. So must watch. It's uh it's a huge, very high recommend from your boy Lurch on the wow. show. Thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for having me, guys. I, I love the show, so listen to it all the time. So appreciate it. Thank you. I'm downloading this for the for the plane right now. I'm downloading it for the plane well, right do, now. Do you, guys t- do you guys touch Let's on the Let's get moaning? around at Sandridge. Do you guys touch on the moaning at all as a, as a casual tennis fan? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Here comes talk, a Frankie question. Just talk to us about the moaning. Is it a culture thing? At this it's point. grunting. It's not moaning. It's oh, grunting. It's moaning. It's They're letting moaning. out letting out air to to hit the ball a little bit harder than you than you usually do. It's, it's strategic. It's That's not science. Is, it doesn't yeah. happen in other sports, right? So, like, I mean, a baseball. Butch Harmon told us to do it on the golf course, right? But he said, wait, 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 wait. You've never heard a pitcher uh, grunt as he pitches? Yeah, a little. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, a little bit of a. Mm. Yeah, that's true. No, no, no. Like, no. I just, Listen I to like David Price. Listen to Clayton yeah. Kershaw pitch. They grunt, dude. Right. I mean, I'm they don't sound like, like the, a, female, uh, the female tennis players on the WTA tour, but they grunt. All right. I'm just waiting for like a Mike Trout home run and just letting out a <laughs> moan. You know, I think it's going to change people's perception of, of the baseball player. But listen, I, I'm I'm a big fan, man. Uh, it was just funny. Yesterday, my buddy was at uh, Arthur Ashe Stadium, and it was like one of those late. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning, or this was two nights ago. 2 o'clock in the morning, he's there, and, and it's just an empty kind of stadium, and there's just grunts happening, and they're echoing <laughs> through uh, Queens. It was very funny. I'm like, you guys just sit there with, like, straight faces on. It's crazy to me. <laughs> You can hear it in Manhattan, yeah. Oh my Some God, of them are pretty great. loud. Some yeah. of them are pretty loud, but I, ha- I had to get that in there. Yeah, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, all right, I downloaded it for the plane, so I'm gonna on the next show. I'm gonna do a little review. But again, we appreciate the time. Excited to watch the documentary, and um, yeah, we'll have to have you back on sometime. Yeah, yeah man, thanks thank for having you. Me, guys. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate it. Marty. Appreciate it. Thanks, Marty. Yeah.